Okay, mesdames et messieurs. Ladies and gentlemen. Take your seat. We want to start. Okay, thank you. Donc, je vais passer la And I'll give the floor to the chair of the conference, who will open the technical part of this conference. Mr. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clevas. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable delegates, I hope that you had a nice lunch and that your batteries are fully recharged for the whole of the afternoon. We are now going to uh, begin the first session. That's the topic, acting uh, as one and delivering globally. Our world, as you know, is developing and the postal sector needs to constantly adapt and to reorientate itself to meet the requirements of our society, which is constantly changing. More than ever before, designated operators need to, to rapidly adapt to the new trends and the requirements linked to IT, and to adapt to, to the requirements of customers. The representatives of UPU member countries and the key uh, players in the postal sector will debate uh, the challenges and opportunities that posts are currently facing. That's to say, to understand who the customers are and what business models need to be developed in order to adapt to the developments of our economies. I would like to present very briefly the moderator of this session. I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Peter Sommers. Peter Sommers was a member of the executive committee of the B-Post in Belgium until 2014. He was responsible there and there was rapid growth in his sector with a large turnover and his area covered the parcel segment of B-Post and B2B area, business to business in Belgium, parcels activities, international parcels for Belgium, for uh, uh, Europe, for Asia and uh, America. They took an innovative direction and uh, things developed accordingly. The B Post parcel segment uh, operates in 10 European countries, in the United States and Canada too, as well as Hong Kong, Singapore, China and other countries. Peter Sommers has uh, got years of experience in posts and international logistics. He's got uh, many years in managerial positions in the area of transport and logistics in Belgium and the Netherlands and in the United Kingdom. Mr Sommers, I am pleased now to give you the floor to introduce uh, this panel and afterwards you will lead this panel. Thank you. Mr. Sommers, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the UPU World Strategy Conference. Uh, after this long introduction, I don't have to introduce myself anymore. Um, 
So uh, I will go directly to the point of this conference this afternoon um, and the reflection on the key trends and drivers of change will for sure influence the future of the postal sector and the decisions of the next UPU Congress in Istanbul. And before we start the sessions and the panels, I would like to ask your full attention for the opening remarks of the Director General of the UPU, Mr. Hussein. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to the Strategy Conference of the Universal Postal Union. It's now time for us to get down to serious business, and this Strategy Conference is a milestone event for our organization. First, and first of all, we'll take stock of the status of the strategic priorities adopted by our member countries at the 2012 Doha Congress. A lot has been achieved since the Deputy Director General and I began our mandates in 2013. The international bureau structures were adjusted to meet the objectives set by the member countries and to respond to the financial constraints on member countries and the UPU. Since 2013, we have stayed the, the course using our organization strategy as our daily roadmap. The UPU's essential activities for all its member countries, regardless of their level of development, were strengthened. As well, major new work areas were launched and new approaches explored and significant progress made in implementing our business plans. Your Excellencies, we have a, a short video which we want to give you, which will just give you a small uh, reflection of some of the achievements we have done. So I would like to request uh, the, the technical people to show up the video, please. Thank you. In 2012, Universal Postal Union's 192 member countries adopted the DOA Postal Strategy, a four-year roadmap for the global postal sector. What progress has been achieved so far? Posts are interconnected like never before, but more data must be exchanged with customs and transporters to improve quality of service. Today, much international mail fails to be delivered within five days. And on average, it takes six to ten days for a typical customer to receive goods ordered from an e-tailer abroad. Only by better integrating postal, customs and transportation systems worldwide and synchronizing processes can end-to-end -end quality of service improve. Reaching foreign markets is difficult for small and medium-sized enterprises. Yet leading economists say governments have much to gain in reducing trade barriers. In Latin America, many small businesses that would have never exported their goods otherwise use the post to reach new markets through easy export initiatives launched by their governments. Based on these experiences, the Universal Postal Union is now helping other countries improve the access of small businesses to foreign markets with its own Easy Export program. The Postal Network must be a critical partner in bringing trade barriers down. Posts are operating in a double-digit growth industry and their parcel volumes have exploded over the last decade. The Universal Postal Union's new e-commerce program provides global solutions to meet customers' evolving needs, such as a new parcel service for e-commerce items, a cross-border return service for goods bought online, and an electronic customs declaration system to speed up items clearance. Innovation isn't just about the latest technology. It's also about reading the market accurately and creating the services customers will need tomorrow. Never before have so many people been part of a formal financial system thanks to postal services. Globally, posts offer financial products to more than one billion people. But there's still an incredible potential to extend financial inclusion to 2.7 billion unbanked people in the world, as well as provide accessible and affordable money transfer services to migrant workers through postal services including the Universal Postal Union's rebranded electronic postal payment service. 
Post offices form the largest physical network on the planet. You often find them in rural and isolated areas where financial institutions don't exist. That's a powerful network for fighting exclusion and empowering citizens everywhere. Steady progress is being made on achieving the goals of the Doha Postal Strategy. But as postal services undergo a radical transformation, only a sustained effort will ensure that the global postal sector continues to deliver integrated, innovative and inclusive solutions for development. Well, I'm sure that small clip will give you an indication of uh, some of the major ideas that we develop at UPU. Ladies and gentlemen, this video you have just seen is only a tiny sample of our projects and activities since 2013. If you want more details, please welcome to Ban next week when we have the Postal Operations Council and you get more of that. Uh, we have, will have the opportunity over the next two days to discuss many of the UPU's successful activities in this cycle. The four main goals highlighted apply to all of us, the International Bureau, the UPU bodies, governments, member countries, regulators, designated operators, and our suppliers and, and customers. I wish to take this opportunity to thank all those working for the success of the Union alongside the International Bureau for their support. In particular, their financial support and their active involvement within the UPU structures. After a little over two years as the head of the organization, I can now look back at the progress made and ahead at the, at the challenges we face in ensuring that the UPU is able to ever more effectively meet our expectations. The roadmap that guides our actions and decisions reflect the global postal environment, an environment marked by profound changes and by certain tipping points. And these tipping points represent both challenges and opportunities for the postal sector. One of the first tipping points I would like to highlight involves the dramatic shift in the client's behavior and consumptions. Today, clients want to be able to access service anywhere, anytime, from their smartphones, computers, and tablets. They want environmentally friendly products tailored to their preferred method of consumption. And they want those products to be delivered at home or right next door. The advent of mobile financial services and online banking and the new players on the market require that the posts also adjust their behavior in the financial service sector. The new consumer is digital and and concerned with sustainable development. This modern consumer has a totally different gauge for the values of a product of service. This poses major challenge for postal operators, both in their business positioning and in terms of physical and virtual architectures of their contact and delivery networks. Adapting to this new condition is no longer an option. It is a necessity. But rather than viewing this new reality as a constraint, posts should consider it as exciting opportunities. E-commerce, the Internet of Things, digitization of financial services, and new mobile payment solutions, as well as the vast quantity of data generated and captured by the postal networks, these are all major assets and position the postal sector at the heart of the te technological revolution. The second tipping point is the shift in the postal traffic and in business models of the post. Although the letter post volumes are dropping, parcel volumes are steadily rising, bolstered by the economic boom. Yes, we are witnessing a radical shift from documents to merchandise. This is leading to a new business model in the post to fit the new revenue structures. Today, Letter mail generates less than 50% of the revenue of the 20 biggest post offices worldwide. The message is quite clear to us. The third tipping point is the global economic recalibration in favor of emerging and developing countries. 
which are changing today, the face of the world, global postal traffic is mirroring these evolutions with a drop in the proportions of traffic between industrialized countries and corresponding rise in the south, north, and south-south exchanges. Migration is a factor in these trends and indeed a driving force. Here again, the postal sector and the UPU have a vital role to play as a facilitator for international exchange and drivers of technological, economic, financial, and social inclusion. Your Excellencies, as the international organization responsible for postal sector, we cannot ignore these tipping points. We need to in integrate them into our strategic reflections and actions. This brings us to the second goal of our strategy conference. After the midterm report card on the implementation of our strategy, uh, strategy for this cycle. Over the next two days, over the next two days' discussions, we look forward to hearing your experiences and views as we delve deeper into these subjects and many others. This debate will inform our understanding of the environment in which the UPU and the postal sector are evolving today and will evolve tomorrow. Innovation, e-commerce, trade facilitation, competition, regulation, financial inclusion, information and communication technologies, social, environmental, and economic responsibilities, etc. None of these subjects will be sidelined as we discuss this in the next two days. Together, we must take stock of our organizations and the postal sector today and shape our future tomorrow. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I will leave the stage. You've heard so much about me. Now is the time to turn to these eminent uh, professionals and uh, great leaders we have assembled here to give us their perspectives. And then I'm sure whatever great ideas that will come out of this place will be forming our future strategy. Mr. Moderator, I wish you success in your deliberation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hussein. Let's kick off. I have a short presentation because one of my challenges this afternoon is timekeeping. So I will go fast. Are you ready for a quick scan, a quick overview of some of my personal views on the industry? So let's kick off. What is going on in our industry? Transactional mail volumes continue to decline. Direct mail is stable. Digital mail is not taking off as a new product driver for posts. Financial services are gaining importance and some posts are becoming big banks today. Many European posts show high profits, but profit is coming mainly from the declining mail business. Canada Post will stop home delivery of mail. New Zealand to switch to alternative delivery. Mail volume is declining, as you can see, with an average of 5% per year for the sample of 19 postal operators, according to an Accenture study. Mail decline escalates even faster than expected in some countries, especially in the Netherlands and Denmark. Mail volume reduced with 60% between 2001 and 2013 in Denmark. Impressive figures. E-commerce is growing fast and with double-digit percentages in every continent. A well-known fact in the meantime and an irreversible trend. According to a Boston consulting study, 70% of the e-commerce has a cross-border dimension. Asia-Pacific counts for 40% of the revenues of the global cross-border e-commerce market. This is great news for all of the postal companies who deliver now the majority of the cross-border parcel and untracked packets. But who will win the e-commerce parcel delivery battle? Who will win that? Will that be the posts? the integrators, or the big four? Google, eBay, Alibaba, or Amazon? The jury is out. A lot of questions are valid and unanswered today. Will Amazon survive as a pure player? We see that pure players in the US are opening stores again. Will the same happen in Europe? Amazon invested a multi-billion dollar in the supply chain and through Amazon Prime, the shipping costs are exploding. Is free shipping and free returns sustainable in the future? 
Will same-day delivery become the new normal? The US Federal Aviation Administration gave Amazon permission to test prime air delivery drones. Is drone delivery really going to happen in our industry? According to a study of the financial research company of Bloomberg of last week, Amazon drones could deliver packages for just one US dollar. Amazon also filed a patent for mobile 3D printing in delivery trucks. Can you imagine you order something online and while the delivery truck is driving to your home, the order is produced in 3D printing? Amazing Amazon. Just have a look at this. The FedEx homepage showing all their logistic services. For every service, today you will find a new provider, a startup, a digital alternative, or a new competitor. Is this disrupting or supporting FedEx business? Do the check with your own postal websites and services, and you will have the same result. A lot is happening in our industry. FedEx announced last week their intention to acquire TNT in Europe. UPS fourth quarter earnings of 2014 were lower than forecasted due to the e-commerce volatile buying cycle and capacity issues. DHL Deutsche Post continues to perform well as the number one logistics company in the world. Japan Post makes a $5 billion offer for Australia's toll group. And Alibaba bought a stake in Singapore Post. Who's next to buy a post? eBay, Amazon, Alibaba? Click and collect is clearly on the rise. Two thirds of the e-consumers used a click and collect service. Pick up in stores is booming in many countries, meaning less parcels to deliver by the post. Parcel lockers are installed everywhere in almost every country. And parcel boxes at home are popping up in Europe. Will Uber expand their activities and use flexible work staff for parcel deliveries. If this happens, the whole postal industry system is at stake. Will the European Commission eliminate the VAT exemption for the importation of small consignments, the famous 22 euro threshold? What would be the impact of this on the imports from China? Will the e-commerce industry and us survive without access to customer data? a very important topic in the EU related to big data and privacy rules. You see a lot of questions, uncertainties, risks, opportunities on our radar. And this conference is a great opportunity to share clarity, views on the following questions. Can posts leverage their networks in an increasingly volatile global economy, the panel one discussion? Are posts innovative, innovative enough to stay relevant for the consumers? Is there a need for a holistic review of the various delivery models due to the e-commerce growth? Is there a need for Post to change their USP of universal home delivery? Will Post win the battle for the SME customer? Is there a need for more regulation knowing that Post gradually become parcel companies? Is the Postal Universal Service really a driver for social and economic development? How important are postal financial services? Can posts contribute to sustainable development? This UPU World Conference, Conference strategy will help us to find the right answers to all these important industry questions. And I wish you a very interesting and an excellent conference. This session of this afternoon will focus on three different topics with three different panels. First of all, we will discuss the rapidly evolving economic environment, then innovation as the key to success, and last but not least, the e-commerce challenge. Everyone agrees that economic uncertainty can have a significant impact on individual and business behavior, as well as on financial infrastructure. And for the postal business, an economic downturn can accelerate trends, such as the decline of traditional business mail. But it can also trigger opportunities. Panelists will explore these as they survey the legacy of the economic and financial crisis of recent years. Our first speaker, our first panelist is Mr. Lin, director of the Asian Pacific Postal Union Bureau. He has more than 20 years experience in the postal sector, particularly in China. 
Previously, Mr. Lin worked for the State Post Bureau of China as Deputy Director General of the Department of External Affairs and later as the DG of the Media Center. Let's now listen to the views of Mr. Lin on what the postal sector should do to face the economic uncertainties of today. Mr. Lin, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. And thank you very much, my friend, Mr. Soma. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here, not only to attend the meeting, not only to be here as the panelist, especially the first one. And also, I'm really very, very happy with the three key words of our conference, namely, innovative, integrated, and inclusive. Because just the same three words I used as my opening speech for the Asia Pacific Postal Executive Committee meeting uh, three weeks before in Pakistan. Now comes the word in my mind Great mind thinks alike. Secondly, I want to share with all of you an example to support my point. You know that in Asia Pacific, we have a post college we call APPC, Asia Pacific Post College. By the way, you are all very warmly welcome to send people to us to get very good quality of training. Now I come back. Normally, for the courses that we conducted, I will deliver a presentation at the beginning of the courses. And according to the information that my colleague prepared for me, the first page would be the explanation of English for the word post, P-O-S-T. That means P means puncture, O means overspread, S means safe, and T means trustworthy. I always asked the participant, is that true or not? especially the puncture, the first, first alphabet with P. And up today, more than half of the participant would say, would answer, yes. And then comes the second question. If a letter from Bangkok, because we located in Bangkok, Thailand, we are very happy, <coughs> a letter from Bangkok to Beijing by the post takes five days, or maybe three days. Is that puncture or not? Normally, it's difficult to answer. I said, it was puncture, takes three days, a letter from Bangkok to Tokyo or to Beijing. Maybe it was also puncture by the post took five days because 30 years before, we didn't have any competition. But now, if it takes two days, maybe not puncture. Because another people can do it in one half days, maybe only in one day. The, part, the most of the participate to attend all courses is the middle level in the Asia Pacific. Now comes the key word of my mind is we need change. We need open. Not only open the door, most important is open the mind. Yes, people can see, yes, we changed a lot. We opened a lot. Yes, that's true. But compared to the general economy, compared to another sector, 
not enough. So we should more open, we should more change, we should more focus on the market and customers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lin, for this uh, short and very precise uh, presentation. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Stefan Kracek. He's Associate General Counsel and Head of Government Relations at eBay EMEA, so one of the postal customers here in the room, and that's uh, exceptional and very good. Stefan is French national born in the Netherlands and joined in 2009 eBay, where he now heads eBay's Government Relations team. I look forward to hear his views on the rapid evolving economy and the challenges that brings to eBay and similar global marketplaces. Uh, Stefan, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Um, and I just wanted to let you know how much of an honor it is as a private sector person here out of the e-commerce world to be in front of this room uh, of what is, to me, the most powerful tool that will change the face of the economy and of commerce in the next 10 years. I think you all and the bodies that you represent in your various countries hold the key to what can become an, e an economic success of inclusiveness in the world economy. And so I'm extremely proud that I am allowed today to share a few of our ideas as eBay with you in the hope that if there is a conference like this uh, in 10 years from now, we can look at a PowerPoint presentation with magnificent growth figures, maybe letters and written posts going down, but parcel delivery should really, as it already do, uh, does right now, show massive increase. And as a result, inclusion of what we see, in particular, small and medium-sized players in the world economy. <clears throat> um, I was, of course, also very proud to see the name of eBay uh, uh, numerous times in, in Peter's presentation. And I would like to issue two compliments. First of all, the first um, video that, that we saw for us as one of the pioneers in e-commerce, in, in the online and technology-enabled commerce, the first video really shows that the UPU has focused on exactly the right issues. And of that, innovation is, of course, key. Uh, also, the questions that Peter asked in his various slides, and there were numerous questions, I think were absolutely spot on. eBay uh, this year will celebrate 20 years as an e-commerce platform. And it's good to differentiate us vis-a-vis uh, -vis Amazon, uh, which was also quite prominently there. They are our competitors, so I was not very pleased to see their name appear um, too often. Amazon is more of a retailer. We are a platform. We actually allow people to come together, buyers and sellers, to find each other worldwide. And just to give you an example, in Europe alone, more than 350,000 professional small and medium-sized sellers sell on eBay. And the value of what they are shipping is in the billions and billions of dollars. So the economy of tomorrow, as we see it, and as we have seen it develop over the last 20 years, has a few elements. And I think one was already indicated uh, uh, also in Peter's uh, presentation. Um, are some of the, the pure players online now also opening brick and mortar shops? The future of commerce is a complete blurred landscape where the consumer dictates how, where, and when he will consume. And that means that both the, the, the commercial players, but also the delivery uh, uh, operators will have to adapt to what the consumer dictates. The consumer is completely empowered, and that has really radically changed to what we've seen in the past. The second point is that you will see less and less influence by the big multinational players, and you will see a much bigger role that will be played by the small and medium-sized enterprises, by the one-man person 
that starts a very small business locally in a remote rural area, and I'm sure you've had it, heard it before, the number of success stories is growing. People that lost their jobs started a small business online and now are not only growing, but they're employing people themselves. And I come back to the point I made to you earlier. How can they thrive? By broadband access, but that's not your problem. Um, by having access to a world market. The broadband is there or will be there. The platforms are there. So people selling on eBay, just to take us as an example, they can reach 170, 200 markets in the world. You can find us everywhere. So you can find the sellers everywhere. I come back to the point of you holding the key. It is not being found anymore on internet or on mobile or in the high street. It is actually making sure that that parcel that has been ordered by a buyer in, in Peru from a seller in Sweden actually gets from Sweden to Peru on time in a predictable, transparent manner. And think of yourselves as consumers. You know it better than anyone else because you're both in the business of the postal service and you're a consumer. What would you like most as a consumer when you order something from a remote country? You want to know when your parcel is going to come. You want to know before you push that button, say, yes, I will purchase this from someone I don't know far away. You want to know how much it will cost you to have that good shipped to your home. And then you want to know when it arrives. So what people really want is predictability. It's not rocket science. They want predictability. So long delivery times, high price levels or strange price levels that are not understandable, neither for small enterprises or for consumers, those are problems that you can tackle. It is unconceivable that if I send a postal package from Ireland to Poland, knowing that the most expensive part is the last mile, it is significantly more expensive than when I send that very same package from Poland to Ireland. Even though I know that the last mile in Ireland is more expensive than the last mile in Poland. How is that possible? Where can I find the information to me as a consumer or as an SME that explains why? And so I can take my decision. Um, and just to finish off, and I'll be happy to take many, many questions if time allows later on. Um, eBay sits on a wealth of data. That's one point that Peter also mentioned. Data is absolutely key. And so we're in a luxurious position of studying various markets and the dynamics. So we recently studied Chile, Peru, Ukraine, South Africa, Jordan, Thailand, Indonesia, and India. And what small and medium-sized companies are doing there on the world, the global commerce uh, uh, arena. And we came to a number of very important findings. And this comes back to my point about you holding the key to the future economic development of the small players who will be the core of world trade in the future. Over 95% of the small businesses that we analyzed in those countries um, are engaging in exporting, much more than their brethren who are only stuck to brick and mortar physical shops. Across the eight markets that we analyzed, the average number of international markets that exported reach is between 30 and 40. And 60, and this is a very important point, 60 to 80% of new businesses that started survived their first year when they sold online. And that compares to only 20 to 50 that survive if they don't sell online. So again, it's a super powerful tool. And with an efficient, transparent, and predictable postal service, I think you can make the difference uh, between an economic crisis or an economic success in the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. That's an important statement that we as Post have the future in our hands to support the eBay and e-commerce growth going forward over the next uh, 10 years. Our next um, speaker, notre prochain orateur, est Monsieur our next speaker is Mr. Moulay Hafid El Alami, Minister of Industry, Trade, Investment and Digital Economy in Morocco. 
He's very well known in the economic social world of Morocco, and he is passionate about business enterprise. He's an entrepreneur himself. He's the founder of the Saham Group, a Moroccan group which uh, brings together highly value-added enterprises together. According to Forbes, he's the 38th richest man in Africa with a personal fortune of $500 million. He, someone like that is capable of having a very clear vision of the international econ economy. Mr. Minister, you have the floor. Merci, cher ami, pour votre... Thank you very much, dear friend, for your presentation, and I'm very happy to be here today a little bit intimidated, given the specialists in the postal world here. I'm just a modest minister who is in charge of a number of subjects, in particular in the postal se sector. So in the discovering this sector, we're very impressed by the changes that have taken place throughout the world and the difficulties that face the various posts throughout the world. Some of them have already developed, and they have made substantial progress. Others are still at the stage when they're trying to carry out this transformation. So what are the socioeconomic stakes that come up here? When it comes to the economic situation, for instance, we too have an international market that has declined over the last few years, a crisis that has affected everyone, including the postal sector, by ricochet, as it were. But we also have globalization that has mo modified substantially the exchanges, the trade relations between individuals and enterprises. Another important factor is the technological in revolution that has of course affected everyone in the world, but for some it has been devastating, in particular for those who have not undergone this transformation because the generations change, change from X to Y to Z, the consumer needs have changed completely, and the role of the post has completely changed. So, this competition when it comes to, is it, is it just the co competition itself or the complementary aspect of it? Now, of course, the internet is a major reactor when it comes to the post, uh, postal section. We can see the glass half empty or half full as far as this, is, this is concerned. But I think that the arrival of this technology is a real potential booster, if I may use this word, for the various post, posts. E-commerce, and we have seen a major example of this just now with eBay and a number of others who ensure that this transformation when it comes to e-commerce can be a major potential capacity for the post, but in particular for governments when it comes to changes uh, for citizens, individuals, enterprises, this also is a major factor. And sometimes we tend to forget an essential factor, which is the unique role played by the postal sector everywhere. It's a trustworthy network that we're all aware of. We all know it. And at the present time, it's looking at the physical aspect, the electronic aspect, the financial aspect. Uh, aspect. But at the moment, we are looking at e-commerce, and we're either in it or out, as far as that is concerned. This is a unique international network, which manages to be both physical and electronic, as far as the post is concerned. And this enables the postal sector to have a position, which I think is a position of trust. Now, the impact of this change, and of course we have heard about this, is the lapse in letter post. This will continue. It, it will not disappear, but it will continue to decrease inexorably. An increase in express post and uh, parcel post. We hope that this will develop substantially, and we have heard about the 3D impression, and apart from the printing of uh, bills, 3D. We hear in conferences uh, that are, to a certain extent, avant-garde. I've 
it sent shivers down my spine when I heard that nothing will be sent at all and everything will be printed in 3D in situ. And I think that maybe we're going rather too far as far as that's concerned. We should keep our feet on the ground. We still have a few decades, a few hundreds of years to develop e-commerce and we have a while before we see the full impact of this major technology. But nevertheless, innovation is an essential element which could lead us down a certain path for the future and a number of public, sect this public sector is looking at this uh, in sector in depth, that is the postal sector and for us in Morocco. We, I had the opportunity to meet the DG of the UPU, and I wish to pay tribute to him here. And in discussing with him, I had saw stars before my eyes when I looked at what is being done by certain posts throughout the world. And this, together with the team in Morocco Post, we have a excellent team with that are very experienced, and together. With the UPU and the Moroccan Post, we have set up an in-depth transformation uh, uh, program for our post. And I was very touched to hear examples of, we've heard of Italy, we've heard another number of postal sectors throughout the world. And this gives, um, leads to a certain amount of uh, jealous feelings on my part, if I may call them. To, because for us in Morocco, we want to be part of this postal modernization movement. And we have also set up a fairly strong project here because teams are working on this for some time to transform our post towards a new model. The post needs to remain competitive and this is what it's trying to do today. But nevertheless, it needs to continue to ensure that there is universal ser service and in particular to invest in the digital sector which is taking up a major segment, 55% and more for the majority of the large posts. And we have heard that Canada has decided to eliminate part of its mail service, and that was rather surprising. But all this is necessary. Major transformations are required in order to help governments to ensure the social and economic development of the country. And this project also has as its objective to look at new areas of growth, which are essential for this uh, postal transformation. So very quickly, partnership with the UPU, I was uh, struck by the expertise of the teams and the quality of the team members. And I think it's important that you can, that I can bear witness as someone from outside the UPU and to tell you that this is, there's an immense amount of wealth in this postal family at the international scale. There's a great deal of know-how, there's a great deal of ability and willingness to share. We really get the feeling that we're part of a family with a real commitment, real technical possibility and potential, and this for a better transformation of our postal systems in order to reach this modern level which is really necessary. And finally, this transformation this is very difficult, of course, to sum up in two words, but this has to go beyond our post. It is a delicate situation sometimes. Sometimes they, our posts feel threatened by this mod modernization, but we need to have a post that is based on something that is able to take advantage of the, the wind of change. I have every confidence with the confidence that uh, the trust that our populations have in our post and to ensure that our post represents a true vehicle for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. The speaker of this session before we start a panel discussion is Mr. Dmitry Strashnov. He's a Russian businessman and now the general director of the Russian Post since 2013. Before he joined the Russian Post, Dimitri was CEO of Tele2 Russia and CEO of Philips Consumer Electronics Russia. No doubt that Russia, the world's eighth largest economy, has an impact on the world economy. And for sure, the issues of the last year have an impact on the Russian economy and the global economy. Interestingly, you have a high-ranked Russian businessmen amongst us to comment on this. Dimitri, happy to hear your views on the economy 
and the ambition of Russian Post to move away from subsidies into a self-sustaining postal business. Please welcome Dimitri Strasnov. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the way we were moving back and forth, I mean speakers on, on, the, on the stage, reminds me of the very old postal logistics which I faced uh, two years ago in Russia. So I think one uh, wireless mic would solve the issue and then we would be much freely to, to deliver speeches. But uh, uh, nevertheless, I think uh, it's very uh, honored to be on this stage and, uh, and uh, share my views on the challenges we are all facing nowadays uh, in the postal industry. Uh, uh, I would really start with, uh, with uh, very bold uh, statements. There is, no, there is no magic recipes. I mean, uh, there were a lot of questions today. How to survive, how to overcome, how to sustain, uh, how to defend your space. So basically, uh, the recipe is very simple. I mean, you have to be efficient. You have to be efficient in logistics, moving parcels, moving letters. You have to meet uh, the customer expectations. Today is even more important to, to do a lot of changes in the level of mindset, understanding the customer needs. Do we need to deliver all the parcels in one day or two days? Would be customer satisfied having three or five days delivery, but with a high predictability level? So can we deliver on promise? Can we deliver in five days if we promise five days? I think this is getting more and more important today because the cost of five-day delivery is in times lower than one day. And uh, in our environment today where we have huge challenges from the markets, uh, when the financial situation is unstable, we need to count each and every penny. And by the way, today when uh, the crisis is uh, all around, what are customers thinking about? And what are they start doing when they were not doing uh, in the good times? They start counting money. So if you can deliver in time and you can do it cheaper, they go to you. And I think the postal operators has enormous opportunity in, uh, in a turbulent times to even win the markets. Because you know that uh, a lot of the uh, companies focusing on express deliveries, well, pretty costly, uh, high-level services, are really getting, uh, getting, getting problems. And they're struggling. The postal services is more efficient in this way. And especially in Russia, because uh, we have an infrastructure which is across the country. Uh, it's uh, 42,000 uh, uh, post offices. Uh, there's a huge, I mean, uh, logistic infrastructure and here we have our benefits compared to any other companies. Uh, well, basically, uh, there were many words said about the trends of today, and I think uh, uh, as we are present in all the segments in, uh, in, in the mail services, in, the, in, a, in a box delivery or parcel deliveries, as well as the uh, financial services, we have, to, we have to be, again, pragmatic. And uh, proactivity is also uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, elements of recipe. Uh, leading in online uh, shifting mails and direction is, is, is a key. So we should not be followers. We should create new products. We should really lead in moving, uh, in moving letters to online. Uh, we become, uh, become a major partner, major carrier for e-commerce. That's, uh, that's also pretty clear. So how to, how to be a reliable partner, how to really meet uh, the customer expectations, I think uh, we all knew how to make it. And uh, financial services, last but not least. Uh, there are many, many postal administrations uh, having chances to provide the basic banking services. So the uh, Russian Post is still at the stage where we are not able to do that. But uh, uh, with coming changes, and especially in the postal law uh, of Russia, so we expect to do uh, the new version of postal law uh, since, uh, well, it's, it's going to be a new version since 15 years, and uh, getting Russian Post uh, joint stock company, so we will be able to provide the basic, uh, I hope we will be able to provide the basic financial services. Um, and I think it's uh, also an important element, which is, uh, 
worst mentioned, so the all the postal operators, uh, uh, all the postal administrations in the countries, they do maintain the social responsibility. And uh, this is not only uh, keeping, the, uh, keeping uh, the postal offices all around the, the country to, to provide the uh, access to the population from the government side and, and, and provide the chance to, to communicate to each other, but also uh, uh, taking the financial sector, uh, it's, it's also solving the issues for end bank population. Well, in different countries, the, the, the penetration of the bank accounts is different, but in Russia, we're slightly above 50%. It's only postal offices and post, or postal bank can solve this issue. So we can really bring the basic financial services to each and every citizen in the country. Well, uh, again, uh, to, to finish, actually, I would like to say that uh, uh, once more we have to focus on efficiency. Uh, we have to rethink the basic uh, processes. Uh, we need to look uh, at infrastructure. We need to look at the last mile. Uh, the consumers are getting more demanding, and actually they are getting younger. Uh, well, the more ambitious, they they are really focusing on the uh, uh, efficiency in terms of spending. Uh, and I think, well, all of us is capable to to address uh, this challenge. I wish all of our success and uh, again, uh, good working days and believe we'll have some more discussions uh, also offline uh, after the session because uh, I would be very interested to, uh, to get uh, your commands and your expertise as well as to share our experience. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dimitri, for these interesting views on uh, the Russian postal business and the economy in general. Um, now we'll have a first session with some Q&A amongst the panelists. And uh, I always was uh, learned that customers should come first. So I'll start with the customer in the room, and that's eBay. Yeah? So I have two questions for eBay. You have here the majority of your postal suppliers in the room. What is the one thing which comes into your mind that they need to change tomorrow to support better your service and your business? Oh, I had a longer list, but... I only uh, have one. <laughs> only have one. <laughs> I th uh, it comes back to my example just uh, before. Price, transparency, and predictability. Okay. I just slipped in the second one. But it's the predictability. And uh, I would like Predictability, to... let me come back to that. What yeah. do you want that we as postal companies deliver? You want to know it's delivered in three days or is it delivered on a certain day? Because that's a big difference. Yeah. What do you want? Um, I want a certain day. A certain day. And if I may just quickly link to what Dimitri said, uh, which is I'm happy to pay less and wait longer as long as I know exactly when the parcel arrives and or pay more and you're happy to pay more when we do what when it arrives quicker if I really need it if I want okay. to have my Apple iWatch so. that's coming up tomorrow to yeah. flash to my friends or my wedding dress which really needs to be there on Friday I don't Friday. want to see you in a wedding no. dress but <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to pay more okay so, so Price related to speed, that's what yeah. you want, and yeah. price predictability. Second question for eBay, when are you going to buy a post? Amazon is buying posts all over the globe. When is eBay going to buy a post? No, ne I, no I never say never. Probably not. What we will do, what many, many people will be doing more and more, is be intermediary between the customer and the service providers like the post and try to group be all those thousands of SMEs that de de depend on eBay and, and, and make deals as an intermediary with the it post. It was a little bit of a joke the question, but maybe it's not. But let me go into that. Will eBay also start to develop their own last mile delivery services? Is that something which is on your map? It is like everything else in e-commerce is being considered. As I know, as things stand, it is commercially very difficult to make viable. So we feel for all of you 
because we know how how difficult that last mile is and how expensive. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. Difficulty in the last mile brings me to my next question is about profitability of posts. Yeah? We see in Western Europe that the posts make high profits, sometimes very high profits. In other countries, there's no profit at all or loss making. What's the view of, and I would say, the postal guys in this area? You can also comment on that eBay, but uh, what's the view on the profitability of post in general, and maybe in your country, and then link to that because link to profit is investment, uh, investment um, strategy. Do the post invest enough? Do they have enough money? And link to profitability. May I start with you, Dimitri, on that? Well, uh, can we have microphone? Yes, yeah, it works. Uh, I think. Uh, as we said today, is that post, uh, we, 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 shift, we, we are actually trying to do the business. So we have to compete in, in a very uh, tough segments with uh, a lot of commercial companies. Uh, so without efficiency, we, we cannot survive. So the efficiency means that we have to be uh, able to maintain profitability. We have to generate cash and we have to invest into the infrastructure, new products uh, and our stuff. Uh, which is challenging because, again, as the post is, is, is a package. It's not only the, the today in most countries, it's not only the uh, express deliveries which are most profitable. Is, is Russian Post today a profitable company? Uh, yeah, well, the, we just announced the last year results, so we became profitable first time in five years. Uh, though um, we have a lot of things to, to be solved, so we don't have, as, as I mentioned already, we don't have uh, uh, banking services. And I think this is one of the key drivers for profitability uh, across the postal administrations. Um, so we, we have to look at all three components. So the, uh, can we be profitable everywhere? Probably not. Uh, in financial services, yes, sure. In, uh, in parcels, yes, we have to. We have to compete to the expressors. In, uh, in letters, well, if you find some solutions, uh, if, we, if we optimize the costs, if we, if we start leading shift to online, why not? So I don't see any, any kind of areas where uh, you cannot be profitable as a pure business. The elements of the, uh, well, the social elements which we have is like uh, carrying on the, uh, or maintaining the, uh, the waste uh, uh, network, vast net network of the uh, postal offices across the country. This is something which is costly. And uh, here's the question, so do we able to fill them with the services required and do, do, do they generate profit or we have to really kind of recover those costs? Okay, uh, thank you very right? much. Mr. Minister, votre... Mr. Minister, your point of view on investment and profitability of posts in general and in Morocco in particular, I think there are two aspects which are quite different, one from the other. We have a traditional post we have a universal service, which is not necessarily uh, profitable, doesn't need to be profitable. It has to provide a service, and the state's role is to monitor this. There is a second aspect now, which has blossomed in recent years. These are added value services provided by posts, and we're beginning to see that there is a major area that can be developed here. Uh, E-commerce is an example of this, and others too. And from my point of view, the post uh, will continue to be profitable over the coming years, provided that operators uh, modernize. Is it profitable today? Yes, they are. the post is profitable today. From what we can see, they are still profitable today. Thank you. Mr. Lin, your view on postal profitability in investments? Oh, it's very difficult to explain. How to say? <clears throat> I think uh, for the UPU members, we have really very, very different situation. So uh, it's difficult to, to say in one word, it should be or uh, shouldn't be. Depends on the different situation, depends on the different culture, different economy, different geographic situation. It's, 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 it's difficult. For some countries, it's, how to say, it's relatively easy to get the purpose to achieve 
but uh, in general, it, it, is, it is difficult. The majority of your members in the APPU, are they profitable or loss-making? You know that? Can you share that with us? Uh, you know, we have almost uh, the most different uh, members than any other restricted unions in the world. We have 32 members. We have a huge member like uh, China, India, with 1.3 or 1.1 billion population. But we have also Pacific countries with only 10,000, 20,000 people. But uh, uh, in general, we can see in Asia Pacific, uh, 50, around 50 to 50. Okay, thank you for that. I have a question related, again for Dimitri, related on the economy and the global economy. We had last year, without making any political statements here, the sanctions toward Russia. Uh, did that impact you as a postal business? Because I know that a lot of uh, import is coming into your country, for example from China. China, Russia was booming, big, big business. Did you saw an impact due to the EU and other sanctions? Uh, well, it's entirely political questions, and then I have to be very smart to answer this question. Uh, I have to say, uh, we, uh, the sanctions as such was not impacting us negatively. Yeah. And uh, the reason is that the, uh, the, the volumes, import volumes from, you know, from online uh, shops, uh, e-commerce uh, traders, uh, they were increasing and they still keep increasing. So China is getting a uh, bigger and bigger share. So I think we, we might see that uh, slight decrease, uh, decrease of supplies from the Europe and the United States, but not, not, not because of the sanctions, because the, the average uh, price per, per pack is, is much higher from the Europe than from China. Uh, a huge number of the uh, small packets from Asia, and it's uh, in the skip going. Let's keep going. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll open now um, questions uh, from the floor, but first of all, there's an intervention from Tunisia. I don't know where Tunisia is for the moment. They want to make an intervention. Tunisia is over there. You have the floor. Please uh, mention your name, who you are, and be very short in your question or comment. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. I'm Madam Hayat, Director of Strategy, Opportunity and Post Speaking. First, I would like to pass on uh, Mr. Nabib's, uh, uh, Nadine's uh, apologies, who was unable to uh, attend the meeting because he's taken on other duties. Thank you for giving Tunisia the floor to uh, share with you the experience and Opportunity and Post to face the rapid change in economic environment. The Tunisian Post strategy is part of the Doha strategy and it fits in to the strategy of the Ministry of Communications and the Digital Economy for 2018 and the main areas are to guarantee social inclusion and bridge the digital divide and to uh, develop e-administration to develop the digital economy to stimulate innovation too in the area of posts and ITCs. The Tunisian Post is aware of the benefits of ITCs to broaden out its range of products and services to different channels, the physical channel, the hybrid channel, the electronic channel, and there's improved quality of service too and greater inclusion. To this end, to be active in the area of financial inclusion, the Tunisian Post has uh, managed to put into place an uh, electronic uh, uh, wallet, and this has allowed the uh, bankerization of numerous citizens through virtual accounts. These accounts have allowed uh, uh, services developed in order to uh, bring in uh, postal customers and to uh, uh, decreased cash circulation and the congestion at post office counters. So mobile services allows payment of bills and money orders to be paid, count to count transfers and debts to be recovered uh, uh, for micro credit for institutions in Tunisia. And progress has been made in electronic payments 
and in postal logistics, which in Newsium Post uh, provides integrated e-commerce services, which is made up of four elements. That's to say, a logistics kit, a payments kit, a back office uh, kit, and a, 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 a recovery service by distance. And benefiting from the image of a post as a partner of trust, uh, it's been chosen by the Ministry of Trade uh, to be a strategic partner in the national project, uh, EDT. And this project is aimed at putting into place a platform in order to allow uh, trade transactions to be performed and to allow products to be uh, uh, traced. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you bring it to a, a, an end? Uh, I'm almost there. Uh, the Post of Tomorrow will be a privileged partner in the area of logistics and the development of convergence at a physical and digital level, thanks to the positioning as a partner of trust with customers, businesses and the government. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for that. Are there further questions? Are there further comments? Uh, Egypt was asking for. Egypt, you have a floor. Merci pour vos... Thank you for the very interesting interventions. I'm the Vice Minister of Telecommunications in Egypt, and I've got a question in uh, relation to how the post uh, helps to limit utilisation of cash. I hope that by the end of today or tomorrow we'll receive a response to this answer. Thank you. This is a question about money, so I'll give the floor to the Minister now who's got experience in this area, in my opinion. I've not got cash experience uh, in the postal sector, but however, everything which allows the sector, the banking sector, financial sector, to uh, replace cash with credit cards and prepayment cards, etc., avoids the circulation, circulation of cash. And I imagine you have the same problems that all uh, emerging countries have in terms of managing cash. Uh, bankerization is an important aspect in this regard. And it allows us to avoid, or to rather to limit uh, the circulation of cash. Uh, the Moroccan uh, means was to uh, speed up uh, bankerization, and this slowed down the circulation of cash. And uh, the postal sector in Morocco uh, has got a, a banking, uh, a banking uh, uh, subsidy and uh, subsidiary, and this is a. Uh, very sound means of moving forward and limiting the circulation of cash. It's a very interesting question you asked there, and we'll go further into that uh, when we look at the financial networks, financial aspects of a postal society in due course. Thank you for that question. Are there further questions? From the floor. Okay, I can't see. There's one over there, but I can't read it from here. Um, I think it's Bina. Bina. Okay, Bina, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And congratulations to all the panelists. I'm from the regulatory authority of Benin speaking, and my appetite was wet with a question asked about uh, profitability of post. I haven't got a full answer about that. My second question I'd like uh, to address to the Moroccan minister. In the model which was presented, the impressive model presented, there are a number of concerns. I couldn't understand the role of a regulator in this. The theme of this panel was to act collectively and to uh, distribute at a global level. So what uh, is the role for regulatory authorities in this new model that you want to develop in Morocco? Thank you. Mr. Minister. Mr. Minister, please could you answer this uh, pertinent question? Thank you for your question. Yes, all regulators have a natural reflex. I could understand this. Having said that, for the post, today we haven't structured the regulatory aspect. Things aren't going too badly, though, and we are discussing the matter with the possibility of transforming uh, the regulation model. We've got the telecommunication regulatory model, and there is a complication. There is a bank, 
and the bank uh, depends on the regulator of the financial sector. And this is a highly complex topic. Uh, uh, regulation is fundamental in all sectors in all countries, and I agree with you about that. But in order for regulation to work properly, what lies below it needs to uh, work properly. We need, first, to ensure that our posts are in compliance with international standards. We're making progress in that area. But at the same time, we need to bear in mind that uh, regulation needs to be developed. When transactions take place uh, and flows take place, regulation comes afterwards. But it's essential that our activities prior to regulation, that's fundamental. And I would like to say we have to be careful because regulators shouldn't break things up. Regulation depends on me, depends on my uh, service, uh, my department, the telecoms area. And we have a tendency to over-regulate rather and that can kill sectors if we're not careful about it. We need to bear this in mind. Thank you. Being on the regulator side, you uh, yeah. agree on what has been said before. You want to comment on that? Yes, uh, Please totally. go ahead. I think this is a very refreshing uh, point of view that we would like to subscribe to. Um, and, and what we say as a private sector player to the regulators is, we're not telling you don't regulate us or don't regulate the sector. But what we're asking you to do is take an innovative approach to regulation, which is a pragmatic one. And what you will see is that what you try to regulate today doesn't look the same in a year from now, and your regulation or your regulatory environment will be outdated before it's actually enacted. And what we call on you is to take a more open-minded, framework-type, flexible regulatory approach, for which there's obviously a role to play for regulators, but one in which they can adapt as technology progresses. And as we've seen on various presentations here, it progresses extremely fast. And I think that's what the, the term castratrice um, uh, kind of like could refer to, is don't become an obstacle, but become an enabler as a regulator. And that's perfectly possible if you regulate in the same way as computer program developers actually develop their new programs and their new products. Okay, thank you very much for that. Regulators don't become an obstacle. That's what they say here. I think that's interesting viewpoint for the discussion tomorrow on regulation. Um, there were more questions from the floor. I think somewhere over, yeah. Uh, Iraq, Iraq is asking the floor. Iraq, you have the floor. And I shukran the same. I'm the director of the post administration of Iraq. I'd first like to thank all the panelists. I'd like to mention in particular the presentation by the Minister from Morocco. I have a comment to make in this regard. There's a great deal of innovation in the area of technology today. In Iraq, We have a fiber optic uh, network, and this network is broad because Iraq covers various neighboring countries in its network. We are currently conducting a study in Iraq. To ascertain whether we can provide a delivery service via the Iraqi post. We have experienced difficulties, however, in deliveries through this modern technology. We want the Iraqi Post to uh, uh, provide these delivery services, but we've experienced difficulties in this area. We'd like to share this experience with our colleagues from the UPU. And we have experienced a further difficulty in terms of uh, trans tran transport services, the carriers. In terms of capacity, we've got uh, problems to deal with there. So it's a broad study which is being conducted and we hope we will be able to cooperate with other countries which uh, adopt uh, a programme along these lines. Thank you for your attention.
يا جواب من السيد وزير الدفاع. Sorry, I missed that last part. Mr. Minister, uh, Mr. Minister, can you answer that question, please? Yes. I wanted to thank you for your intervention. Yes, we've all experienced this transformation at various levels. What matters is that in these areas, we are able uh, to develop at a universal level through the UPU and directly. You're welcome. Our modest knowledge, uh, and I repeat this, our knowledge is modest. When I look at what's happening throughout the world, we've got a great deal to learn. But we have uh, moved forward, and we will make our knowledge available to you. And I'm very willing to uh, receive you and to share our experience with you and your teams. We have achieved some good results in certain areas, but other areas haven't been so exceptional. And when you use the postal network, other networks uh, react accordingly, and they understand how flows can be geared towards a post. Uh, and uh, I am very happy uh, uh, the prospect of sharing this experience with you, and we can understand what we can draw from that as a lesson and share it. Thank you. There's a further question now from Uganda. Uganda, you have a floor. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, the person who wanted to speak was Panama. So, no question from Uganda. There was another one. Some... Nigeria. Okay, Nigeria, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, for giving me the floor. I quickly want to share a little experience on this email uh, e-commerce uh, product. Uh, most of the cross-border e-commerce products come received in Nigeria come through our sister designated operators. And when they do come, they come in form of small letters, small packets and they are not registered. Most of them are not registered. And they contain valuables. So on arrival, they have to be given special treatment. If they are to be delivered as ordinary letter post, those items may be, the security of those items may be endangered because they contain some, they contain attractive uh, valuables. So in the process of Given special, special treatment to those items, our administration charge what we call handling charges. And this is resisted by many of, or some of the, uh, the, the e-commerce uh, uh, addressees who claim that they have already paid for the delivery and could not pay any other extra costs. So the point I'm trying to make is that um, these e-commerce items contain valuables, and therefore they cannot be delivered as ordinary letters. And if they are to be given special treatment like EMS or like parcel, it will attract additional costs. And the e-tailers want uh, asking for a very cheap cost of delivery. I do not know if they take this into, into consideration. In okay, so, the, so what's your question then? Yeah. And, and the question is for eBay? Yeah, to, they to, charge you too much? Yes, the e eBay or any of the, any of the uh, private sector uh, player in the e-commerce uh, 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 business. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the intervention. You want? We we charge nothing. I mean, no, no, we're, we're we're innocent. Um, so <laughs> that's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure what role eBay c can play here, but but uh, I would want to say is that uh, as a platform, a third-party platform. It's the responsibility of the buyer and the seller, and in this case, the seller, 
to fill out forms correctly, to be transparent also from their end on what, what the good is that is being sent. And I come back to my point about predictability and transparency. If there are extra costs involved because the product that's being shipped is of a certain value and needs a special treatment by postal services, then that should be visible uh, when the transaction is made so that the consumer actually knows what that an extra uh, cost is is going to be paid. It's all about transparency. As long as people know in advance and they accept, there should be no problem, in my view. Thank you very much. Dimitri, you want to comment on that? I just want to add a few words. And as far as I understood, the issue is that uh, uh, the number of the small packets uh, uh, from uh, e-commerce is increasing, actually, those packets, including the valuable goods. And uh, there are certain requirements in several, several countries, and by the way, in Russia as well, all the small packets has to be registered. So it makes uh, the small packets are well pretty costly, or at least uh, um, the process. I mean, it takes it takes. I mean, a certain additional uh, procedures, and it, it makes it makes additional cost. Uh, I think it's a more internal internal question for UPU uh, related to tariffs because. Well, if you're importing these goods, so basically at the end of the period you, you, get, you get compensation and uh, if the uh, sender sends those small packets uh, as unregistered, then you have to register, so you carry your cost yourself. Uh, so I think it's, it's more, more a kind of internal discussion Thank among so the... So more work to be done by the UPU, they're all so. here, the IP so. is here, I think so it's a pretty should they take note of many, your question? Many countries. Yeah. Mark. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Um, with this, I want to close this first session and I want to thank our excellent speakers to give their views on these topics and, and answer to sometimes difficult questions. So please give them a hand. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. Uh, you can leave the platform and in the meantime I want to ask the panelists of the second discussion which will go on innovation uh, to come on stage and that Mr. Botan Sebeni, Dr. Benton, Philip Metzger and Professor Kalamu Kalamula Ramli. Please come on stage. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Excellent. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Tot ziens. Bonjour. Enchanté. Mijn micro is ook so what order do we run the same again? So yes, yes, please, yes, please, yes, yes. So, so it's, it's first, uh, it's, it's, it's Boton, then Dr. Benton, Metzger Benton. and Ramley. Benton. Okay. Boton, you're sitting first. Yes, yes. Thank you. This man is going to give you the seating oh, order. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Ramli. You're Professor Ramli. Sorry yes. for the pronunciation. Oh, no problem. My microphone is still. They all go out for a break. I wait two minutes or we continue? No, continue with people. I think we're getting too long, they to start disappearing, so. Yeah, good. Yeah. You have a microphone. Okay, they don't microphones. I, we start. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon again. We continue with the second panel discussion on innovation. And innovation has always been a part of the fabric of public postal services, which has been around for centuries. But as the global environment is changing, there is a need to innovative, 
faster and better? What must Pulse do to be at the cutting edge? How can better integration be achieved between different types of postal services? Must developing countries invest in new technologies before strengthening their core services? Panelists will explore what POST must do to be as relevant as ever in today's competitive communication market, looking at the lessons learned from other sectors. And our first speaker for this second panel on innovation is Botan Sebeni. He's the Secretary General of POST Europe. Prior to his post-Europe ro role, Botant worked for Magia Posta in Hungary, in which he held the post of Executive Director of International Business, and he was a member of the Executive Committee. I'm eager to listen what Botant has to explain to us on post-Europe and the innovation trends he sees in Europe and amongst his members. Botant, you have the floor. So thank you, Peter, for the kind introductory words. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As already all the speakers underlined, it is a privilege for me to be here with you. Actually, uh, I'm returning onto this stage after seven years at the 2008 Geneva Congress. I already had the possibility to hold a speech. Uh, that was about another topic, about the financing of the Universal Postal Union, which is still, I guess, an important uh, topic uh, for the UPU. So my role is here uh, today to give you a snapshot about the innovative mindset that characterizes the European postal industry and to position Post-Europe as the Association of the European Public Postal Operators in this uh, arena. So I do not want to go into the details of describing uh, Post-Europe. I just underline that we are an operator's association of all the European uh, Union and non-European uh, Union universal service providers from uh, the whole geographical Europe with uh, splendid uh, figures characterizing the physical uh, delivery, uh, collection, and retail network that we are very proud of. Uh, some basic uh, characteristics of our industry. Uh, probably uh, it doesn't contain, this slide doesn't contain any new information as you have seen already uh, some uh, very good background uh, items, very good uh, background dimensions uh, describing the uh, postal industry development by Peter Sommers. So declining mail volumes, uh, high legacy cost, including the universal service obligation, e-substitution, and the increasing competition, especially related to the parcel market. Another uh, main uh, development uh, that is important in our industry is the change in the paradigm, uh, the change in the DNA of the postal sector. Uh, we definitely see uh, this dynamic here uh, in Europe which is practically the, swift, uh, the switch uh, from the traditional push model to the pull model. In the past, the client, the uh, e-seller, uh, or uh, the big accounts, the utilities, the banks, financial services, telecoms, were the kings. They were uh, the owners of the transactions, while the addresses played a rather passive role. And this has changed. We are changing to a push and pull model where the consumers, as we could hear also in the presentation uh, of eBay, uh, have become uh, the owners of the transactions. They are pushing the button on the computer. They are launching uh, the transaction. They are setting the parameters. And they create uh, for themselves the expectations. And the e-retailers and the delivery partners have to cope with these parameters set by the consumers, have to cope with these uh, expectations, which is a special challenge uh, for our industry. Something special also in Europe, as we see currently as an emerging trend, the privatization of uh, some of the postal operators. Uh, currently, uh, within the European Union, uh, 
uh, we see seven postal operators fully or private, uh, partially in private hand, and uh, we can also add to this two, three other possible uh, transactions of similar type that are in the uh, pipeline and that might be uh, confirmed in the coming uh, period. And then let us see what the postal operators uh, can do in this context. We have uh, a unique know-how and we have some key strength parameters that we can uh, leverage on. We have a very long uh, tradition. We have the largest physical retail and delivery network. Uh, we are the, um, uh, uh, the biggest or among the biggest employers in every country or in most of the countries. An immense portfolio diversification has happened in the recent uh, period, including also in some cases a geographical diversification. And again, in most of the countries, we are the trusted partners. And last but not least, we can also add that uh, in a number of countries, in a significant number of countries, the postal operators are in a relatively good financial uh, health. A case study of the uh, cooperation taking into account uh, these uh, parameters is the Postal Industry Initiative uh, on e-commerce, an innovative approach uh, in Europe based on the market forces, based on the market needs, but not forgetting uh, the European Commission drive uh, either. The European uh, uh, Postal Operators Industry Initiative on e-commerce is about addressing some key features of the delivery uh, parameters of the postal operators and the delivery capabilities of uh, the postal operators. You can see on the slide uh, some uh, key features of this type. And here I would like to underline uh, the engine role of the International uh, Post uh, Corporation that is managing the uh, e-commerce interconnect uh, program. And we can also mention in this context that uh, there are talks within uh, 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 this arena between uh, IPC and UPU also to align as much as possible uh, the interconnect program with the Ecompro of uh, UPU. So, Taking into account all these uh, uh, development uh, uh, items, uh, the innovative mindset that is available in Europe, we see an emerging uh, innovative uh, business uh, portfolio into our uh, landscape. Postal operators are innovative uh, in the letter mail area, in the parcel area, uh, diversifying into the financial services, logistics, mobile telephony, uh, e-government uh, services. This is a very positive trend. We have to underline that uh, we have to keep, even when being innovative, uh, both feet on the ground. First, we have to defend the core as much as possible and then also to deal uh, with the growth opportunities. And in this context, Post-Europe as an industry association can indeed play an, a role uh, through uh, best practice exchange, know-how exchange, common uh, development uh, activities, not only uh, within the European Union, but also beyond the boundaries of the European Union. We have recently launched a program called Post-Europe Neighborhood a uh, program in also in cooperation uh, with uh, UPU to address the specific needs of the Eastern and South and Eastern uh, European uh, operators. So all in all, we can say that the European postal industry is a, a dynamic industry with a lot of uh, growth opportunities and also building on our core uh, capabilities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Bothond. Uh, we move on to the next speaker, who is um, uh, Dr. Benton. He will share his views on innovation with us. Uh, Dr. Benton is CEO and President of Saudi Post. He led the restructuring of Saudi Post and the modernization of postal services in Saudi Arabia and has a great contribution on the industry uh, at the global level. Now, Dr. Benton has the right organizational skills is a certainty due to the fact that before he joined Saudi Post, he was a deputy minister of Hajj and Umrah affairs, where he deployed a successful 
e-government project that serves over 5 million Muslims who visit Saudi Arabia annually to perform Hajj and Umrah. Dr. Bentham will explain us the key success factors of using technology to facilitate new solutions and product innovation at Saudi Post and will share his views on regional cooperation. Dr. Bentham, the floor Thank is yours. Thank you very much, Peter. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, let me start by just looking at the mission of the Post. And I think uh, I've heard uh, a lot about the change in DNA of the Post and the changing trends, and I'm going to prove that's not. I think the basic mission was to deliver letters, but we have three dimensions to work on. One is the size. So we deliver from letter, we may go to parcels, and we may go to boxes, and we may go to full containers. So this is one dimension. The other dimension is the time to deliver whether it is tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, five days, 10 days. And then the third dimension is really from where and to where. So it's a distance. Where do we pick up or should the customer come to the office and where do we deliver? Is it within our territory or somewhere else? I think looking at these three dimensions really, this is what will take us to the future. To be able to do this as post, we have to invest, to invest in a lot of infrastructure. Even to do this simple letter delivery or parcel delivery or express delivery, most of the posts, and whether it is companies or administrations or corporates, have invested a lot and built a lot of networks. For example, these are the networks which are the necessary ingredients of any successful postal operator you need a transportation network so that you could move your stuff maybe from offices to centers to other cities and you need local uh, delivery network really the, the last mile delivery you also need some offices where you can serve your customers who come into your office and of course you invest a lot in technology where you want to be able to track and know what, what, what is happening in your organization. So building those four networks, I think, will give you the opportunity to expand in any of the three dimensions that I mentioned earlier. Also, will give you a chance to exploit some of the uh, capabilities that you have gained by building these efficient networks, especially the computer networks that you have built. And of course, we always proud of our postmen and women, which is the fifth network that we have. So I'm going to show how do we utilize, how do, how do we utilize these networks to innovate and to succeed and to make more money and to help our people. Now, I always have this slide and I look at it as the consumer world. Well, the world is changing. We know that three and four and five years old kids now have iPads and iPhones. So these are our new consumer. It's not me and you and, and, and the people that we used to know before. Also, we know that people who go and the labor that work now, they go back home and they open their computers and use Skype and Tango and other means to communicate with their families. They don't send letters anymore. If you look at the caricatures down, you see somebody who's calling the pizza house, said, can you send me the pizza as an attachment if I give you my email? So this is the way the people are thinking. And then that little girl asking for her password because her mother only gave her the name and not the password. And that little boy is, is wondering why God gave us five fingers and not two because the mouse, this is what he needs in life, has got only two buttons. And finally, the guy doesn't know anything except his email address. And I think if we look at our networks, at our capability, at our consumers, we really could serve them well, and we could find the right products at the right time for the right people. This is e-commerce, which everybody has been talking about. We tend at Saudi Post look at e-commerce as only four components. It's store management, cons I mean, uh, customer management, payment management, and delivery. Now, 
uh, I think if we ask uh, the people at eBay or Amazon or Alibaba or anybody who is doing e-commerce, he knows that 97% of his problems is delivery. And in, in some other countries like ours and, and many, uh, it's payment. Because most of the people do COD and then you put your neck in the hands of the customers. He said, no, I don't want it now. So you have to pay for the return also. So it's delivery and payments. That's why we think that the post have got all the components to be the most successful e-commerce platform and player. E-commerce is not just the uh, business to consumer, it's business to business, business to government, and business uh, to, to consumer. So all sorts of uh, and consumer to consumer. We, uh, in Saudi Post, we have two kind of uh, services that we offer. We offer a marketplace, just like eBay, where we don't do the uh, store management. We don't handle the merchandise. We deal only with catalogs and uh, items and prices that we get. And of course, we do the customer service because we do the delivery and we do the payments. And it's basically making money out of resources that, you, that we already have in the post. The second type of e-commerce, which is really the, the store management. Sometimes you have to buy some uh, maybe good products that you want to ship and you want to do the logistics for it and send to the customer and make more money of it. And of course, the guy who called the pizza house and wants it, and wants it as an attachment, I think we can help him with our model. Of course, not only within Saudi Arabia. We also, we know that most of our customers, or many of our customers also, also buy stuff from the United States, from Europe. So we made arrangements with companies to give a local address in the United Kingdom and in the United States. And we facilitate local payments. I mean, so they, they ship, if you buy, if you are in Saudi Arabia, you go to Saudi Post, and, and, and you buy, or if you go to Amazon, for example, you put your US address in there, which will go to one of the companies that we contracted, now it's UPS, it was iParcel and it is bought by UPS, and they will ship it to us. So it will be cheaper and this will facilitate, this is what we call Wasil al Alami in Saudi Arabia. Uh, also we have, it's all about agreements. We have a full agreement with Amazon that any shipment that is going to Saudi Arabia, regardless of the way the, the customer chooses, it will be sent to Saudi Post, and we deliver it there. Of course, Amazon is a big company, and uh, they, they re their reputation is very important, so they had to test Saudi Post and make sure that they can deliver, and they, and they satisfy the requirement so we can deliver for them in Saudi Arabia. And of course, e-government. What, what is e-government? There are, again, government to consumer, government to government, and government to businesses. These, either we have it, as I said, we can deliver documents, because we have the delivery networks. We have, uh, we can deliver documents, we can receive customers in our offices, because we already have the office network. So many of the things uh, that we do in e-government, basically utilization of the networks that we have. But we do something more in Saudi Arabia. We have the addressing system, which we had to establish as Saudi Post in the country, and to zip the whole country, so we have data in these zip codes. We have demographic data, which helps the government to be an e-government, to plan well for opening schools, for opening hospitals, for deciding on so many decisions within the country. Of course, financial services. Again, we have the uh, IFS, we have a local bank, uh, we have offices, we could transfer money cheaper for the people who would like to transfer money. So I think there is no change in the DNA of POS. It, it, it is just moving in one of the dimension, either up or down, and utilizing the resources that you have. Finally, we have a transportation network. We converted this transformation network into a logistic network, which really now our, 
and, and, and it is changed, and in, in fact, it's a company now. It's going to be a listed company. It's called Naqil. Uh, this company, only 15% of its work is uh, postal work. The rest of it, it is a basic, almost a basic infrastructure for the economy. We handle all the fashion stores in Saudi Arabia. So they don't have to stock sizes, different sizes in different areas in the, in the country. They just, I mean, the lady comes in, her size is 42 and only 44 is available. She goes to the cashier, he will put it in, in the system, it will go to Naqil, Naqil will bring it from any uh, other part of uh, uh, this store. Also, we are infrastructure for the food industry. You know, Saudi Arabia is almost a continent. And we have a problem with the expiration date of, of canned foods. So since we really uh, go over 6,000 points within the country, then we pass almost by every store that carries some of these canned food. So we handle most of the major brands, whether it is Nastale, Alali, Goody, whatever. We keep a record of the expiration date of all the canned food within the country, and we take it and we deliver the new ones to this. Now, the final, uh, and of course, direct marketing is the thing that we do. We receive mailing details, we have the database, we can clean, we can help, we can alter, we can print, and we can post and deliver. We handle a number of airlines, loyalty cars like Al Fursan and Sky Team and, and, and others. We handle the delivery, the printing, the management of the database and delivery of these items. Of course, the other thing, the most important thing is telecom. Now we own, uh, we are a major uh, holder with Libara. Of course, I'm sure everybody knows Libara in Saudi Arabia. Libara, Saudi Arabia is majorly owned by Saudi Post. For what? It's for a resource that we have. It's the offices that we have in Saudi Arabia. And the company is, is, is doing very well right now. Uh, of course, uh, we had to alter so many things to be able to serve the customers and the trends that we have seen. We are using 24 by 7 convenient delivery uh, mail stations. And of course, a very important part of our uh, computer network is the RFID tracking system. Everything is trackable within Saudi Arabia that goes to the post. We have RFID tags that goes into EMS and into, in, and into our boxes and everything, anything that goes in and out in any of our installations will be tracked and trackable. And of course, a very important thing is the KPI monitoring. We have people who sit down and watch these gauges to know are we doing well or are we, are, uh, or we are not. And to figure out problems when they happen because we believe that we know that when a package is going to be delayed before the customer knows. He will know when it comes five days or six days and he did not get it. We know this two days earlier that it's going to be late. So we have to respond to that and tell him that your package is going to be delayed. Finally, we, we mean business. Most of these units that I talked about already, companies that we own as Saudi Post or we are part or we partly own with some businesses in Saudi Arabia. Thank you very much. And I think we'll hear more about this later. Thank you very much, Dr. Benton, for this interesting view on what is happening at Saudi Post. The next speaker is Philip Metzger, the Director General of Ofcom, the Swiss regulator. Philip worked as uh, attorney in 1992 and he's worked in the IT corporation and for EFTA as director uh, before he uh, went to Ofcom in 2007. Philippe will explain the point of view uh, of the digital innovation in general and in the postal sector in particular. Philippe, you have a floor. Thank you. Chairman of the Conference, Excellencies, Honourable Delegates, it's a pleasure for me to speak to you today 
and to discuss the topic of it, innovation. It's the first time that I have uh, addressed the UPU and in particular the strategy conference and it might be a non-conventional introduction but as a beginner I hope I'm entitled to do so. At this type of conference uh, I've realised in fact that this week in Geneva we have the 43rd uh, uh, Salon uh, in Geneva and the UPU needs to be congratulated on the excellent timing of holding the, uh, the this conference at the same time as that important event on migration and uh, we hope that we will be able to go to the Salon and to see what's happening in that area too and we will be able to take forward with our discussions today and tomorrow. Briefly, I'd like to discuss two aspects on the, te on the topic of innovation. First, we have innovation in the digital area from a citizen's standpoint. And the second uh, aspect, more precisely, is the positioning of the Swiss government in terms of postal innovation. Let's start off then with innovation of uh, digital citizenship and uh, the Swiss uh, Federal uh, Communications Office is charged by the Swiss Confederation with uh, taking account of innovation in uh, ICTs and we need to shape the future of the digital uh, future of Switzerland in close collaboration with our partners. We are in an era today uh, where we have multiple stakeholders, to use the English term, and we need to harness our efforts and to involve a private sector, and in that way we will be able to better serve uh, citizens. The strategic objective of our government in the area of uh, information society is aimed at making the Swiss economic area competitive and to ensure that ITCs can uh, be of benefit to all of us. What we have noted is that ITCs uh, have uh, fields of action in which uh, the postal sector can draw in order to progress in this area. People become increasingly mobile. They're using smartphones for a whole range of services. You're all aware of this for email, for, for uh, to make online shopping, to pay for bills and if we can mobilize our efforts we will cover a whole range a plethora of possibilities and the postal sector can develop in this area and we have noted with pleasure that many of these services are being provided uh, by postal uh, providers and by other providers too the technological developments uh, can also be seen in new forms of participation. This is a second uh, aspect uh, here. Uh, we have an electronic voting uh, agenda, for example. We have a simplified access agenda, uh, an access to the information of uh, uh, businesses, and this information is being made available to all and as part of this administrative process, which is becoming increasingly transparent, uh, we are increasing our uh, profitability and accessibility of government services, and we're managing to overcome obstacles. Uh, and this is bringing us closer to citizens. Many possibilities are opening up as a result. And of course, we shouldn't lose sight of the challenges we face. There are challenges in the area of security, in the area of communication, in terms of protection of data and we need to have a sound legal basis in order to take up these challenges and we also need to train citizens in particular young people who are highly capable technologically speaking and they need to understand the challenges they will face in the future. And I'll provide you with an example here. We have a program in Switzerland, a national program, which consists of promoting 
and uh, improving the training of young people in the digital era. So access to uh, citizen uh, digital citizenship, which I mentioned, should be a, a pillar of democracy. Uh, this is an area of strength in Switzerland, and we need to bring together e-government on the one side and e-routing on the other side. Uh, and this way, we can uh, identify uh, important areas through which businesses can provide services in this area, in particular postal enterprises. Uh, uh, one example, the Swiss Post and other providers too in Switzerland are active in the non-postal area, have developed uh, a series of services and there is much scope for innovation here and we've got secure uh, mails too in this area. There's a whole range, a whole areas in which we can innovate. Uh, the second uh, aspect of my brief uh, intervention is more focused on uh, positioning in the area of innovation in the postal area proper. First, I would say that innovation is not only about uh, technological new products, but it's about too about being uh, a communication uh, tool as well. I mention this uh, because it's important to bear it in mind. Uh, innovation is not uh, automatic. It doesn't happen like that. It, things go further. Commercial aspects of innovation are often put forward. These are the first aspects which are examined. And sometimes we lose sight of a fact there's a human factor involved, which is very important too in the area of innovation. The human factor continues to be uh, essential. And if I can mention this interesting point, another area I'm familiar with, uh, we've got a very broad human network, and that's to say the post. We've got more than 600 uh, uh, offices, post offices, more than 600,000 offices worldwide. And uh, the... The sector is focused on innovation and ethics, and there is a very important human factor involved in the postal sector. Uh, innovation from a technological standpoint is very important, but we need to look uh, through a prior study of the effect uh, of society and the impact of society. We can't regulate everything, of course. I've heard uh, earlier today, I heard a Tunisian minister who spoke, and uh, uh, we said that the regulator shouldn't break things up. We don't want that. We want innovation uh, to uh, provide for a, rat a broad array of uh, areas. And we need to have balance, of course, in this process. Innovation is not a goal in itself. Uh, it needs to be uh, weighed up uh, with uh, our lives and society as a whole. As regards the UPU, to conclude my intervention, even if innovation is not uh, directly about uh, what lays behind it, the UPU uh, can uh, stimulate uh, in the area of innovation. We have noted with satisfaction and with encouraging uh, comments made by the Director General that the organisation is innovating through its products and through the service it provides. The UPU does provide innovative uh, products and uh, operators uh, uh, can adopt these services and taking things fo forward, we can exchange information and the UPU can contribute even more in this area. Some have mentioned this already today, interoperability, for example, uh, for service of small packets which have been developed and to overcome lack of transparency and uh, trust. All of this, of course, is a uh, break to e-commerce. So there is a really rich area that's uh, open up to us and we need to overcome these uh, complications and innovate. On this occasion, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, the WTO on its work in this area. A number of factors were resolved. We've got uh, agreement on facilitating uh, exchanges and we hope we'll be able to facilitate the area of e-commerce too. We can only encourage the UPU to further develop its standards uh, and to regulate the postal sector. And the UPU is a platform 
it's a spirit of openness behind this. Uh, we've got the stakeholders who are traditional stakeholders. Uh, we need to have international cooperation, of course. We need to have uh, organisations involved. Uh, we had to use one example. And uh, uh, we, of course, are available uh, to uh, play a role as a facilitator in this area. Many thanks for your attention. Merci, Philippe. Thank you, Philippe. He says there's no obstacle. You're not uh, you're a regulator, but you're not providing an obstacle. We really like this. Thank you. Professor Ramley, Director General of the Ministry of Communication and IT in Indonesia. Professor Ramley holds a doctor engineer from the German University of Duisburg Essen and a master's in telecommunication engineering from the University of uh, Wollongong in Australia, if I pronounce it well. Professor Ramley will tell us more on his views on the implementation of the Doha Postal Strategy, diversification of posts, financial inclusion, innovation, and how the Indonesian postal sector enabled and implemented innovation. Professor Ramley, the floor is yours. Thank you, moderator. Peter. Honorable delegates, the thing, this thing is, ladies and gentlemen, as we are aware of that, the rapid development of ICTs has significantly impacts the growth of postal business, particularly letter post services. The certain circumstances has driven postal operators to innovate and develop parcel posts, logistics, and financial transaction services. Business competition in the postal service requires governments to concern seriously. Henceforth, a healthy competition climate can be achieved. Moreover, state-owned postal operator is also required to conduct various breakthroughs so that it is able to develop its postal businesses. Indonesia makes the Doha Postal Strategy as a guidance in the national management and development of postal services. The government performs important roles in facilitating cooperation among postal operators and related government institutions or agencies such as Ministry of Transportation, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Finance, Directorate General of Customs, determining standards for universal postal services and commercial postal services through ministerial regulations, and defining universal postal services tariffs and tariff formula for commercial postal devices. Indonesia government encourages the utilization of ICTs by developing Indonesia national single windows in the effort to accelerate goods inspection process by customs, which has been integrated within the ASEAN single window. The government also entrusts state-owned postal operator as an agent of development, for instance, as a distributor of government direct assistance to society and general election strategies. In the field of financial services, Post Indonesia utilizes ICTs to develop its business on financial services independently or through joint partnerships by scrutinizing the profiles and needs of its customers. Several services which have been developed comprise of instant money order, online gyro, online payment. Recently, it has launched a financial service called MPOSPAY, a digital service which enables subscribers to easily perform transactions just from their gadgets. We are also conducting a survey in four provinces in Indonesia to identify money-saving patterns in households. The results of the survey, it is known that 41.8% of those societies save their cash within their homes, given the marginal propensity to the safe assumptions, MPS, that is the additional proportion of society's income to be saved, is 25%, thus the amount of society's collected funds within one year will accumulate to, to around 500 billion rupees. Taking into account the results of the mentioned survey, and as a precursor to implement financial inclusion, the government designates Post Indonesia to conduct a pilot project called the post-saving accounts. Why? Because its expansive network reaching remote corners of Indonesia with around 4,000 post offices, 
3,700 online post offices, 236 mobile services, and 24,000 point of sales, then uh, Post Indonesia is a logical choice of this project. Second, it applies relatively lower administration charges. Third, it is highly trusted by the society. Even in some corners of Indonesia, people trust a postal services more than banks. Although the bank also very limited in the major cities and uh, regions. Regarding the implementation, uh, sorry, during the beginning of 2014, Post Indonesia has also launched an e-commerce clearinghouse service to ease and bridge SME's needs in selling their products to domestic and international markets through online selling. An advantage in operating the e-commerce service is that it integrates an e-commerce portal with distribution networks and payment. To expand its distribution and service networks, Post Indonesia has also developed the Post Agent model, which does not require any additional asset investment and minimizes expenses which may currently emerge in the, or in the future, as well as it contributes towards the empowerment of the people economies. With the purpose of optimizing idle company assets in various locations, from a cost center to become a profit center, Post Indonesia also expands into the property business based on the highest, based on the highest and best use. Study conducted, idle assets are identified, developed, and professionally managed by subsidiary companies in the property sector to become business centers such as hotels, offices, malls, and etc. It is also good if I mention here Indonesian government will also establish national e-commerce development plan that will be finished by the end of this year. It will facilitate the integration of postal sector into e-commerce ecosystems, e-commerce value chain. For your information, e-commerce transaction in Indonesia is 15 billion US dollar. In the year 2013, it, be it became 18 billion dollar, 18 billion US dollar in 2014, and is predicted to reach 24 billion dollar by, by the end of 2015. Based on this presentation, it can be concluded that the key factors to Indonesia's uh, trends in developing postal sector are as follows: first, provision of regulations which accommodates postal business developments. Second, sensitivity of stakeholders in anticipating developments in the business environment. The third, provision of services which fulfills society needs. Fourth, utilization of IT as an enabler for service innovation. The fifth, escalation of operation with relevant business entities. And the last but not least is the society's participation in determining ex the expansion of postal services points. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Please join us again for the panel discussion. And I want to start with um, a question for Dr. Benton. Um, innovation in a postal company can only be successful, in my point of view, when there is top management attention, when the CEO is convinced, when the CEO is uh, is steering, heading the innovation programs, is uh, freeing up budgets, is giving people the opportunity to succeed or to fail also in innovation. How is it organized in Saudi Post? How did you structure the innovation tracks of your teams and your company? Can you share that with us? Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, a strategic plan is very important. And I think one of the things that we did in Saudi Post is first to have a strategic plan and uh, set up deadlines and clearly uh, have initiatives and where are they leading to. And of course, um, I think you never get uh, strategic plans implemented at the right time because we have a board at the top of us, uh, which always uh, or many times 
will sack down some of the initiatives, but we have to try again and again. Uh, but I think this is the key, is really to have a strategic plan <clears throat> and to have the initiatives available and the benefits of implementing and going on the road clear to everybody, uh, even if, for example, the CEO is not there. There are people who know their role and what they are supposed to do in order to go forward. Going back on that, or going further on that, is there a specific innovation team that works on new plans, or is it embedded in the organization of the business? Um, I think uh, we have a good team. Uh, so uh, when we sit down, we have, uh, of course, regular meetings, sometimes weekly to discuss these initiatives and the direction and, and what is happening in the postal world and in, in the consumer world. And I think from this we get the ideas. Okay, very good, thank you. Botond, um, Post Europe has a lot of members, European postal members. Coming back on the same question, is innovation high enough on the agenda of the CEOs and the executive committees? Do they spend enough time on it? Do they free up enough budgets on it? What's your view on that? Yes. Uh, so we are an industry association. Obviously, our membership is uh, very different. Uh, we have uh, big members, small members from west, east, north, south, uh, with uh, more developed markets, less developed markets. So it is obviously difficult to, uh, to give you a general uh, picture. However, I see that uh, the situation has definitely changed in the recent years. So innovation has become uh, more and more important on the agenda of the top management. And fortunately enough, not only related to the possible growth areas, e-commerce is an obvious example, we see how much uh, important is to us through uh, the industry initiative. So it is unavoidable uh, to the CEOs to, uh, to not to uh, discuss, of course, about e-commerce. But there is uh, innovation also related to the core business. We underline at all the cases, at all the occasions, that uh, of course we have to look at the growth uh, opportunities, but uh, before introducing drones, uh, before introducing 3D printing, which might come in the future, we mustn't forget that we have a very important core uh, business and it was interesting also to see uh, by chance you were chairing the same uh, uh, session uh, with the three uh, CEOs uh, in Vienna uh, it was uh, Belgian Post, uh, Portugal and uh, Austrian Post and they were all describing a similar strategy defending the core being innovative on the letter mail because here in Europe, and I think me as post-Europe, I can talk about the European specificities. Here uh, in Europe, we have still, even with the decreasing volume, relatively You still high. have to invest in mail, that's what you're saying. Okay. Absolutely, and it's good news that it is on the agenda of the top management. Okay, thank you very much. Innovation, we have seen a couple of examples in the postal world, and I heard Mr. Benton mentioned that he is delivering pizzas in Saudi Arabia through the mailman. Yeah. So in going into food delivery, food delivery is the next big thing in e-commerce. Yeah. Uh, a lot of posts are doing some trials on that. Austria Post is doing it, Belgian Post is doing it, German Post, Deutsche Post is doing it, maybe many others that I don't know yet. Um, first, Dr. Benton, are you in food delivery today? You mentioned something or not, but is the, is the mailman delivering groceries at home or will uh, they do that? Uh, it's not the uh, food delivery, home delivery. I mentioned about the canned food industry. So it's a logistic operation. That's, that's something different. That will you deliver tomorrow fresh pizzas at home? You know, I, I mentioned two things. Since if we invested in a network and we have a capability that we could utilize, will do anything. I mean, we do other things, maybe other posts don't do, uh, because we have the capability and we have the people and we have the network. So I think maybe if uh, people cannot deliver pizza, 
we will deliver it, and uh, if people cannot even bake it, we'll bake it and deliver it. So <laughs> <laughs> that's not so complex in Saudi Arabia with your temperatures to bake it on the road. Yeah. So Switzerland is also doing tests and delivery of groceries. In the UK, for example, 20% of the groceries are ordered online already today. Yeah. So I think it's a big thing. What's happening in Switzerland? Philippe, can you share with us what's happening with the Swiss Post in this area? Um, give you the same degree of, of information as, as the CEO of, of Saudi Post, since I'm not um, representing Swiss Post. As a regulator, Post. you I'm, should I'm, know I'm what's not, happening. By the way, just to set the record straight, um, Ofcom has a number of regulatory functions in the postal uh, affairs. Actually, is a rather good governance system where we have really a, a function as, a, as part of the ministry. Uh, we have a, a uh, postal commission that is the actual regulator, independent commission, uh, that is nominated by the government, just to, to set the record good, straight. Good to hear, but go to the question, please. Is well, Swiss, this question is difficult for me. To, I, haven't, I haven't personally received any groceries from Swiss Post yet. Uh, what I would like to say, maybe from a governance perspective, um, going into new, into new realms of, of business and detecting new opportunities in a, in a segment that's really new to the population may be easier for a post that um, still has a very uh, high public profile, uh, rather than being overly innovative, let's say, or very innovative on traditional services. So I think, in general, it's easier probably to break new ground than to innovate in a, an established type of service that the citizens and the customers know very well. Okay, let me touch it to something else. We have the biggest network in the world, all the posts together. We are the biggest employer in the world. I think we also have the biggest fleet in the world altogether. Mm. And probably, and for sure, we are the biggest polluter in the world. <laughs> We're talk, all talking about many, many years about innovation in electric vehicles. What's going on? What is happening? Because I don't see it happen. Everywhere in Europe where I go, and even in the US and other countries, it's still the normal vehicles are there. Sometimes you see an electric bike, and sometimes you see one test with a couple of electric vehicles. What is going on in industry? Maybe Dr. Benton, you first and then Philip afterwards. Are you delivering with electric vehicles yet? Uh, let me uh, just explain how we are doing the business. I think uh, what we try to do is whenever we have a very well-defined sector, for example, if you look at the logistics sector, Naqal company, which was originally a transportation network of Saudi Post, it became a company. Now it's doing the logistic, now it's going to be listed and IPO'd. Uh, we don't regulate, and even the postal regulator does not regulate that company. It's the transportation commission which regulates that company. If you look at our financial operation, we have a company called Irsal that we established with a local bank, and now it's going into uh, full financial businesses. We don't regulate this. So it's totally regulated by SAMA, the Saudi Monetary Agency. Uh, the uh, Libara company, which is the telecom company. We don't regulate it. The My ITC question is on not yes, a regulation. I understand. So My question is that's on why electric we tried, vehicles. I tried, at least with my people in Saudi Post, is uh, to run away from a postal regulation because we run networks and we want to utilize them to do our job. But you job. don't need a regulator to, to buy electric vehicles, do you? So, so, I mean, what I'm uh, leading to is that the, uh, well, the most of the people who have the cars is this Nakal company. Okay. So they are regulated there, and I think they are trying to do th something, but we, are, we don't have to do with that anything. <laughs> <laughs> Philippe. No, since, since, you, since, you asked, since you asked me a question earlier that I couldn't really answer precisely, I certainly see more electric uh, tricycles than, than vegetables uh, from the Swiss Post. So it is quite clear that is, that is on. So the, the, the on. mailman uh, comes with an electric tricycle in Switzerland. I haven't seen any, any, any uh, uh, old-fashioned engines anymore. Professor, Indonesia, electric vehicles? Yeah, there is uh, electric motorbike, ele electric uh, bicycle. Yeah. OK. In, government in subsidies or not? Is it uh, pure their own initiative? Government? Uh, give subsidy to, to electric vehicle, but unfortunately, until now, f not for the electric bike, the electric uh, car. Electric cars, yeah. okay. Botons, your view, briefly, short? Yes. Europe, we have very good examples, and beyond the electric vehicles, I think it is important to underline that we have programs 
uh, both uh, in the context of post-Europe, IPC and UPU in terms of reducing the greenhouse gas mm -hmm. emission. And we have reached, as an industry, very impressive uh, results, minus 10 to 20 percent. And I think this is the bottom line that counts, and of course, electric vehicles can contribute Good. to okay. that. Okay. Before we go to the floor for more questions, I have one other topic which was mentioned by everybody I think here in the panel it's about the digital innovation yeah. over the last let's say 15 years in all the conferences that was the biggest topic of post yeah before the e-commerce was there now it's only e-commerce everybody was going to invest and make plans and big promotions on the digital innovation and digital platforms for hybrid mail and digital mail and so on and so on. As far as I know, nobody as opposed ever made money with that. Yeah? Can I come back to that here in the panel? Is, is, are you making money with digital products as you post? Of course. Uh, I think uh, the digital investment is really the thing that uh, helped us now make money. For example, these uh, dashboards that we have, it let us monitor everything in Saudi Post, and this is without the, digital, the, the investment that we did on the network and on the GMS networks and, and uh, links to readers, and it wouldn't uh, work. Um, these uh, mail stations controlling it, and even yeah, but that's something different. I, I clearly no. Want we to make know money out of this digital mail. Digital mail. You can make money. The marketing, uh, the direct marketing center. I think it's making good money. Uh, it's getting, it's printing invoices for uh, okay. uh, some of the bank that do still print paper invoices, and it is delivering the, uh, as I said, the airline uh, loyalty cards and packages. Uh, to the people. But there's a physical component. Still. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's important. And, yeah. and, and I think uh, that was a good investment. Okay. And it will have uh, also some more uh, uses for that in the future. Okay. Professor, digital mail as a product in Indonesia, is it making money? Uh, I think Dr. Benton, as the CEO of the Postal, company knows better than me, then I think they make money. But they make more money in digital services, not digital mail. Okay. Like a transaction, money transaction, financial transaction. Good. Okay, we'll now open the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, I think we have a first request from Tunisia. You Tunisia have the floor? Is that still on, Tunisia? There's nobody from Tunisia. Then we go to Moldova. Moldova has a question. Where is Moldova? Or Moldova? Nobody here? Okay. Then France here in the front. Thank you very much, moderator, for giving me the floor. Yes, just on the question that you raised on electric vehicles, we have the example of the French Post, because today we have 21,000 electric vehicles. 21,000. 21,000. So 25% uh, of everything that has uh, the, the, that's a vehicle, two, road, two wheels, three, three wheels, or four wheels is electric. And is it... Your own initiative, or was it decided on by the government? It was our own initiative, but there was also a government initiative when it comes to utility vehicles, the commercial vehicles. Electrical vehicles, it's not just good for as far as pollution is concerned, but it's also good for improving the working conditions of the drivers. We've had a drop in accident rate of over 50% when it comes to drivers of electrical vehicles as opposed to petrol or diesel driven vehicles because there's no gears to change, there's no noise, so the drivers are much more aware of environmental factors. And this also knocks on to a decrease in absent absenteeism, about 6% when it comes to electrical dry, uh, vehicles, so all that is taken into account. Thank you. Even? I think it's, 
I can't read it from here, but I think it's uh, Nigeria. Nigeria. You have the floor. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I hear in this conference and uh, in all postural discussions, the, the common word is uh, innovation and innovation. And then in my own opinion, innovation um, uh, stands on, uh, on, on knowledge and also investments. And uh, as we all know, gathered in this room, we are postal administrators of different um, uh, uh, um, um, growth levels or different levels. And uh, um, in this issue of innovation, uh, I, I think the post has been left behind because we did not take knowledge very seriously. And most of us still are not taking knowledge um, um, seriously. Uh, I can give you the example. What makes all of us shiver today is internet. And the internet, in my own opinion, is actually um, the post office uh, 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 virtualized. Uh, you look at all the, the processes of internet, it is the post office processes from the beginning to the end. It's, and and the, the, anybody that created internet really studied the postal uh, um, uh, processes. And it is because uh, the post didn't take knowledge uh, seriously. So what is changing the world now is taken from the, from the world and, 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 and produce and make us to be running after that. Now, um, how seriously... Can, can you come to your question, please? Yes, if the you question, have a question is, for how the seriously are we taking research and knowledge in the, in the field of, of, um, of the post? Okay, is that a question for some particular panelist? Yeah. Or and is it... also, about the investments, is, is, is it only selling? Because the post is not only the, the physical mail uh, aspect or delivery aspect. It's also a three-dimensional thing, the physical, the, the, the digital, and also the financial services. So I hear also, uh, like you also ask, ask somebody uh, from maybe e eBay whether they are going to buy a postal uh, um, company. So does it, are we discussing here that uh, um, the post uh, or, or is only for for, for, for delivery of e-commerce, and it's only maybe e-commerce uh, companies that can buy over postal administrations. Thank you. Okay, I think we had already answers on how important innovation is and how it should be on the attention of the executive committees. Your question is specifically, um, is a post only the last mile delivery for e-commerce or is it more? Is it also the, the digital comment and so on? Uh, Philippe, tu veux répondre à ça? Want to respond, Philippe? I, th I think it's a very pertinent observation from, from the delegate from Nigeria. Um, I could maybe make a little comparison to a different sector, which is the media sector. We have a very similar discussion at the moment in Switzerland within the media sector because the traditional models of producing print, in particular, um, poses a huge challenge going forward for those, for those uh, newspapers and, and, and editors. And I think it's true that, you know, as long as the case was valid and as long as things worked, fine, innovation wasn't too high on the agenda. And so I think now everybody is challenged in a sense, and I think that goes for the media sector and also for the postal sector, as has been mentioned by the delegate from Nigeria, that innovation is higher on the radar and it becomes, as you said, it becomes something for the CEO and a, a major strategy aspect. So I think in that sense, we are all challenged here uh, in this and we have to step it up in a sense to, uh, to meet the, the challenges of the future. Okay, so innovation is not only on the last mile, it's broader, yeah. it's also on financial services, yeah. it's also on digital service. Innovation covers the whole uh, postal industry. Professor, you also want to comment yeah, on yeah. that? I want to comment on, 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 uh, on, that, on, that, on that things, yeah. I think we could, we could see the postal sector similar to telecommunication sector. We have to, to think in three layers now. Physical layer in, it, in which how you deliver the physical the physical uh, things, the physical package to, to the last mile uh, person or last mile house. 
And then the network layer, which is the, the digital layer, and how you manage your network digitally. And then the last, the last one is the, the upper one. It is very important, is the application la layer, application level. This is how you innovate your services in order to be, to be sustained in, in, this, in this world. I think we could see the sector post very similar to the telecommunication sector. Good, thank you very much. Other questions? Okay, I see over there a request, which is Iran, if I'm not wrong. Iran, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would like to make some comments with regard to digital investment. Uh, we believe that uh, digital investment does not directly generate money. It, also, it uh, always avoids losing money and, of course, it uh, helps us improve the quality of our service. Uh, I've heard when Dr. Button uh, were talking uh, about his uh, presentation, I've heard about USO. Uh, how do you consider USO in e-commerce de development? In, according to our data, we have uh, our own uh, e-commerce platform. 30% uh, of e-commerce uh, items generated through online shopping are delivered in rural areas in Iran. Have you got any idea in this regard? Thank you. Philip, can you answer on, on this question? It's USO, it's regulation. Well, of course, in a, in a converging uh, world, we, as far as the Swiss experience is concerned, we certainly have a very strong universal service when it comes to the, to the networks, the telecommunication networks. And that, I guess, would serve us in the future as some of these services move uh, online. On the other hand, of course, for the physical uh, presence and the physical distribution, that's also something which has a very high uh, political uh, rank. Um, and which is, which is something which needs a political discussion to determine what the scope should be and how it is supposed to be financed. Okay, thank you. I hope that answers the questions. There was another here, uh, Dominican Republic, wants to have the floor, you can have it. Please push the button, please push the button first of the micro phone. Push again, please. Yes. Sí, he al, al doctor Benten. Eh, el protocolo que ustedes han establecido de control. Well, the protocol for quality control that you have set up for the distribution time, time of distribution, was it a difficult protocol to set up? Was it difficult to implement? Or, well, did you encounter any difficulties, major difficulties in doing this when it comes to the staff, the, the people working for you who work with this in distribution of products when it comes to control, time of distribution? Can you tell us what difficulties you encountered there? Sorry, there was a little bit uh, lost in translation in the beginning. This question is for who specifically? For who is this question? Al Dr. Benton. Al, al Dr. Benton is for Dr. Benton. Or the direct, the direct, that's is to say the director of Saudi Post, please. Thank you. Difficult issues to deal with is the uh, workforce in the postal industry, especially if you are changing the way things are going to work. Uh, so we have a special sector uh, in Saudi Post called change management. And they are in charge of looking at the issue. How are we going, for example, if, if the delivery man is not used to have a deadline in delivery or number of items to deliver and we want to impose such restriction, then those guys in the change management sector would go and make a program for, for, for those guys who are going uh, through a change in their style of work or uh, the way they are going to do the work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Of course, uh, I think maybe in Dominican it's the same since it is part of the government. I mean, uh, it's a government organization. You always have difficulty in firing people and changing 
maybe positions, uh, uh, but we have, we have to deal with it. We have a strategic plan, we have to implement, we have uh, time limits for delivery, we have money to make, uh, otherwise we cannot do our future projects. So I think people, uh, you have to be tough sometimes in these issues. I'll say thank you, Dr. Benton. I, um, before we close the session, I have two questions for all the posts in the room. And please raise your hand if I ask the question so that we have a view on what is happening in your company. We talked about electric vehicles. Yeah. Which post is today already using electric vehicles? If you use electric vehicles, please raise your hand. So which post is using already today electric vehicles? Okay, gives an impression. And the second question before we finish, we talked about delivery of groceries, delivery of food as probably one of the biggest next steps in e-commerce. Today we deliver packages, we deliver goods, we deliver parcels with fashion, shoes and so on. Who believes of all the posts in the room that in five years from now you also will offer a service of food delivery and grocery delivery at home? Who believes that? Please raise your hand. I think we still need to go to a restaurant for a pizza. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank our excellent speakers and please give them a big hand. Thank you. So this is the end of the second panel, which was on innovation. And we now move on to the third panel discussion, which is a very important one on every agenda, which is e-commerce. So may I now ask the speakers of the third panel to come on stage and that's the following persons, uh, Mr. Wagner from Brazil, Mr. Ma, Mr. Deepak Chopra, Philippe Wall, Anne Mirou, and Jeremy Dutte. Please come forward. Sorry? Can I just say a quick word? Yes, yeah, perfect. I think we are good on time. Yeah. Very well on time, yeah. Come to mind and changes. It's not going to be Jeremy Douté, it's uh, Nicolas Martin. Ah, that's bon. going to be my first point. Yes. That? Wow, that's... Uh, yeah, thank you very much, thank you. Sorry, my... Just handwritten your bio, so you can get a bio from me. Yeah, that's amazing. Can I do? I'm sure, yes, 12. Yes. <laughs> so, yes, that's uh, great. Uh, what is your yes. name? Nicolas. Nicolas. Martin. Yes. And you're... Exactly the, the other co CEO. Ah, you're the other co CEO. <laughs> That's the advantage of having uh, two CEOs. Peter, thank you very much. Thank you very, oh, thank, thank you very much. I give you my card. Here you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. Thank you. So, how was uh, the new direction that we look at things? Very good. Oh, good presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah? I, like, I think it was one of them. Yeah. Very good. We, we catch up later? Thank you. Oh, merci. Très bien. J'ai vécu à Bruxelles pendant 5 ans. Je suis très belge. Oui? Ah, oui. Très bien. Merci. Ah. Hello. You're Mr. Ma. Mr. Ma. Okay, Mr. Ma. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Really, thank you. Est-ce que je peux te demander ta carte? Mais tu as perdu combien de dizaines de kilos? Uh, yeah. Pas de dizaines de kilos, uh, quelques, cinq, cinq. Merci, parce que j'avais plus de Ah, ça va, monsieur Wall. Je vais parler en français. Pas de problème. Deepak Chopra. We know each other. We have seen each other before. Somewhere in a conference of the IPC. All right. Yeah. Okay. I worked at Bipos before. Yeah. I try to stay below the radar, occasionally come out and then go back again, so... But you, now you come out, very good. <laughs> Bonjour, Madame Mirou, euh, enchantée. Bon, le micro est encore euh, là, alors je dois être prudent ce que j'ai dit. Mais prenez votre place. Euh. 
Jerry give you? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I didn't go to the, uh, the bio. You have the, the bio uh, of this guy. So, that was, yeah, so that's the bio. Deepak, Philippe Wall, and Miru. Um, so this is his name again, Nicolas Martin. Insert mm, right. 2000 the best retail lounge, world retail rights. Right. Very good. Okay. Okay, wait. We have the Ministry of France. Once inter intervention, then I have IATA. And then there's another one. I have the Swiss. Then there's Chile and Costa Rica. Chile. Okay, perfect. Got it. No, 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 no. Here. It's up to the way up there. I got it. Good move. Got it? Yeah. Here on the case. This is excellent. Yes. Extremely well. Thank you very much. I think so too. A very near for you. <laughs> very good. Right. So you'll be to, you're okay for the club? Well, yeah. Sure. It's fine. So good. Yeah, we're good, good on time. You mm. don't have... You don't have... Okay, we we have one more translator here for Mr. Wagner. Um, Cherry, one translator, one translator. We have one. We're missing one translator. Uh, translator headphone. One translator headphone. Do we have another one? Yeah. Yeah. You can take or, take already mine. I'm going to take it. Yeah. You can take the palace and that. No, no, you can. Now, what is the question? You can speak over there. Can, can speak? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, we go around I have here. A, I have a little exposition. Very good. Okay. So you have 10 minutes maximum. Ten That's minutes, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. You, you, you help I will, me. I will give a sign. Oh, sure. Okay. Too busy. Yeah. So, may I ask you to stick to the 10 minutes? 10 minutes, of course. Even longer. Even longer. Please cut off. I will cut off, yeah. So, please, sorry. Please, to the 10 minutes. Voilà, ça déjà. On a prévu 10 minutes pour vous aussi. 10 minutes pour vous, ça va? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, vous avez 7, j'ai entendu. Je vous fais 10 si vous voulez 10. Non, non, mais. Je fais ce que vous voulez. C'est très bien. 25 minutes, je vous fais 25 minutes. Non. 2h10. <rire> Le bac de Zélis, ça va, très bien. 5, 10. Parfait, parfait. Comme ça, on a un peu de temps pour euh, la discussion. Ça va, merci. On va commencer. Uh, yeah, it's fine. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Can you please take your seats?
Can you please switch off your mobile phones and put them on silent? And maybe also put your voice on silent so that we can start. Okay, please take your seats. So good afternoon and welcome to this last session of today. I think a very important session, knowing that e-commerce is on the agenda of every executive committee in the postal sector and maybe of every company today in the world being the retailers, financial companies, financial institutions, everybody is looking at e-commerce. And we have a very distinguished uh, panel here that will talk about it. But cross-border e-commerce is recognized as the most important sector of business development for Post and is one of the key strategic areas of focus for the UPU members. In order to respond to the opportunities presented by e-commerce, the UPU consolidated the entire work on e-commerce into one program called Ecom Pro. And you have seen a movie earlier today which enlightens more what Ecom Pro can offer. But I will repeat it again because it's important that everybody understands what it means. It covers all the areas of the entire value chain, including webshop management, marketing, payment system, fulfillment, delivery, customer care, and returns and repair. With this in mind, panelists will emphasize the need for the UPU to continue to act swiftly to meet market, consumer, and operational needs. The operational efficiency and market responsiveness of postal operators will be key drivers for the sector success in gaining and retaining e-commerce market share. Let me hand over to our first speaker, which is Mr. Pinero de Oliveira, the president of Brazilian Post since January 2011. Mr. Pinero de Oliveira was a member of the executive board of Banespa and was the CFO of Banespre, the pension fund of Banespa. He was subsequently the president of the Petros pension fund, the pension fund of Petrobras, a well-known a company in the Brazil uh, country. So, um, Mr. Pinero will give his views on e-commerce in Brazil and on the UPU topic. You have the floor. Please come forward. The presentation. Presentation, please. Thank you very much, P Mr. Peter Summers. Quero cumprimentar a todos os painelistas. Tem uma breve apresentação para ser feita. There is an issue with the presentation, so there is no presentation in the computer. No presentation? Yeah. Bem, no problem. Huh? You, you, do you want us to look up for the presentation and that you come afterwards, or you, can you do ah, it without? No problem, no, no. Uh, uh, we'll okay, thing. perfect, thank you. Without a presentation. Bem, muito boa tarde a todos os senhores, todas as senhoras. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor for me and for the Brazilian Post, and it gives me great pleasure to be able to participate in this UPU strategic conference. I would like to congratulate the members of the panel and Mr. Peter Summers. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that e-commerce is growing rapidly throughout the world and Brazil is no exception to that. And I'm sure you all know that in between 2011 and 2014, there was a 100% increase in e-commerce in Brazil. And it, which means that in about only four years, we increased four times, by four times, the value of e-trade. 
Ich komme es. The number of consumers have gone up as well as regards um, purchases by Brazilians. That those, those have increased as well. It's of the same magnitude. Which means that we can... Brazilians are really buying products from China and the USA. All this is why we should pay great attention uh, to consumers and users of e-commerce and also because at one point when the postal at this point when the postal sector is going through a difficult situation I have no doubts at all that this is of great importance particularly as regards parcels and logistics, because the postal sector can become a major supplier of logistic products, particularly for companies um, encouraging e-commerce. These these companies very often don't have traditional don't engage in traditional trade, they only engage in e-commerce. And this is why we are paying uh, particular attention to this in problem. We realize what research is going on. It uh, shows that customers are becoming more demanding. They want to have rapid information, they want to use digital media. And in view of the uncertainties affecting the postal sector, we see that this is a way of giving, um, uh, of giving prompt service to our customers. And customers want to be able to decide how their products are delivered. So the delivery place can be changed by electronic means. All this is a complex is complex work. The customer has to be given a choice. And all this at the forefront of the concerns of Brazilian Post. We can offer a differentiated logistical process, which has not always been the case. We've not always used this approach for our customers, especially as regards parcels, but we have now introduced this in Brazil. We've always been the leaders on this market, and we shall continue to do so if we make the necessary investments and keep up with the times and provide differentiated products promptly and using um, uh, powerful computer technology. And in this way, we'll provide a personalized service satisfying our customers' preferences. So Correos Brazil has been working a great deal on improvements to logistics and parcels. These work hand in hand and we make investments every day in in equipment, in the training of postmen who are the ones who deliver the parcels and we use intelligent uh, phones and to speed things up And we even uh, managed to change the place of delivery during the working day. We account for more than 40% of the Brazilian market. And many of these services are well known to you, such as SEDEX, 
EMF. Or ex export a facile and import facile. Well, this applies to products both within Brazil and coming in from abroad. We've established various different ways of um, reverse logistics for after-sales service. This means that we can link up uh, purchases with customers, uh, uh, selling companies with the customers and improvements in computer technology mean that together with some e-commerce companies we can set up virtual shopping centers technological integration is something essential we believe for the existence of the posts worldwide. And we uh, are trying to ensure that this integration takes place so that people, ordinary citizens, can be assured that their parcel can leave the factory and be delivered at their place of work or at their home. depending on what the customer has chosen. And he will be informed in advance through remote terminals. And this also means that the product can be returned if necessary. We have interactive delivery already. Our postman over the next six to ten months, we'll all be working with intelligent phones. So that they can follow through the products till they're delivered. And so that there can be interaction. Once the products are going to be delivered. And this will also ensure that our staff's productivity is higher because their work will be easier day to day. The objective of Correos Brasil is to provide secure ways of carrying out e-commerce, which will lead to an increase in e-commerce internationally and increase the trade of SMEs in the country, including micro-enterprises allowing them, too, to have access to the international market by opening e-commerce points. We've seen this already in China and the US, for example. We also have many associations with um, negotiation centers through e-commerce. E Over the last three years, we've been working on legislation so as to update it and update our pastoral service and make everything automatic, both service to customers and to companies, so as to broaden our presence within Brill and outside Brazil as well. We've greatly broadened our financial association with Brazilian banks. And in the last 24 to 30 months, we have managed to become a financial service that offers banking and financial services, such as credit cards, current accounts, and even insurances. In other words, today we are a business on the same footing as banks. We're the financial sector, and we are the only agents of the Brazilian banking sector. 
the only bank that does exist in many municipalities. There are no other banks apart from the postal bank. We've diversified our products and this has led to reduced costs. We have more than 7,000 um, post offices. We have a service for entrepreneurs as well. In other words, at the moment, we have done an enormous amount of work uh, to ensure that Correos Brazil is profitable because there was there is a real need to meet the needs of the public. Our core business is to be a major supplier of logistics for the whole of Brazilian society. We have facilitated the efficient um, sending of parcels and we can be profitable in providing all these services through diversified products, through um, virtual telephony, the financial sector, the selling of insurance and similar products. And we're working very hard to continue to develop e-commerce, which continues to expand because we want to be the leader on this market, which is growing exponentially every year. And I'm sure we can be a major supplier of integrated logistics. That is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, and I'll be very pleased to answer any questions. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Pinero de Oliveira. Um, this interesting presentation without PowerPoint slides. Important. So, next speaker is Mr. Uh, Ma. Um, he's the Director General of the State Post Bureau in China. Mr. Ma has decades of experience in the post and telecom sector, and no doubt that he will have interesting views on e-commerce in China, because a lot of things are happening there, as we all know, as we all can read, and as we all could face. And online ordering of goods is huge and booming in China, no doubt. Mr. Ma will tell us more on collaboratively promoting the fast growth of the parcel industry and the challenges plus measures that need to be taken to facilitate better development of e-commerce. Mr. Ma, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Now it's five o'clock. So I hope my speech uh, won't bore you up. And at the current stage, we are facing the big data and the mobile internet. And this era cause effect impact on our traditional industry. So we should also focus on the opportunities that brought to us. And that is the most important task our leaders in the post area need to do. With the Chinese system, uh, postal system become more opening up, we focus on the uh, collaboration and synergistic development between the post and e-commerce, e and we have scored great achievements. Next, I would like to give you an introduction about the development of our e-commerce industry. In the past four years, the Chinese post sector and uh, Express delivery, uh, especially in concerning e-commerce parcel, increased by four times, and the annual growth is about 50%. Last year, the Chinese parcel express volume exceed 14 billion. I think that is the top in the world. And during this process, e-commerce has made great contribution 
In the 14 billion volumes, about two thirds are brought by e-commerce, and about five to six billion volume, 75 percent are brought by e-commerce. Therefore, for our Chinese post sector, e-commerce is the engine and the booster. And during the development, we have also innovated a lot of products to adapt to the development. In the past four years, the parcel and express delivery prices reduced by 40%. And the number of our uh, post offices has also increased by 60%. Therefore, we can bring more convenient services for our customers. In the past one year, the Chinese Express delivery industry has made a lot of breakthroughs. And now the e-commerce and express delivery as a supply chain can bring great complementation to our traditional development. In the last year, the e-commerce and express delivery has generated 10.7% of the total sales volume and every year it also increased a lot. So if we can see the double 11 festival, this is the picture shows the double 11 strike. And this is an every, uh, our daily volume it, uh, surpassed 100 million. That is about three times than our daily operation. And with our business development, our traditional business has been affected. We can see from the picture in this slide, on the left side, that is our airplane of China Post and our parcels. So the daily volume is very huge. On the right side, that is the largest shopping mall originally in, in the past in China, but now they are have been affected. And we have shut down 147 large shopping malls and this trend is continuing. So such development trend has caused great impact on our traditional retail industry. Under these circumstances, What's the next step for our business development? What's the challenge of us uh, we are facing? Under such large volume, how to make sure our internet can be de delivered to our uh, customers in a safe way? The e-commerce has different business flow with the traditional mail volume, uh, mail service. The e-commerce are more flexible. During the festival, they will have huge volume, but during the other time, that would be not that much. So how to make sure we have an orderly and uh, flexible network, that is our uh, task. And for challenges, the first one is that it's about the balance between post express delivery and e-commerce. We have hundreds of thousands of uh, e-commerce sellers, but the major one is less than 10. And the top two share 90% of the market. So the e-commerce platform and the logistic platform should be uh, synergetically developed with each other. That is a very sensitive issue. And the standards usually comes from the upper stream. That will affect the post sector and the downstream. So how to make sure the upstream and downstream to jointly address the challenge and share the benefits of development, that is the problem that we should address. And another one is about the quality, quantity, and safety. 
no matter express delivery or parcels in China, they develop rather fast. That's come from the great development of e-commerce. But it also caused, also caused a problem of service quality and the safety. Now please look at this chart. In the past four years, although the business volume increased by four times, the complaints from the consumers also increased. So that means people, the public, still have complaints about uh, services. So we should have a balance between the quantity and the quality and the safety. Another, another one, another challenge is how to uh, balance the sellers and the end users. For our express delivery industry, we usually have the system of postage paid by the sellers that will be incorporated in the price of the sellers. So the upstream Pricing, the price demand and the user's service demand have uh, will be contradictory to each other. That is also a challenge we should address. The fourth challenge is that we have the single service capability, but we have the multi-dimensional demands. With the development of e-commerce, apart from the groceries, now we're also facing the demand for high-end products. And since this year, we also have the demand from the food. That is to say, we should also provide services such as the cold chain services. That will also be a challenge for our next step development. So. What's, what can we do about that? For our strategy, first, we should have the mid and high speed gro uh, growth, uh, speed up, mid to high speed of growth. Another one is to work towards the high level, uh, mid to high level of development. And we have a 2020 strategy uh, plan. And uh, we expect the volume of the express delivery to be doubled in one year. And second, we will also expand the sales volume to two trillion US dollars. Another one, we should also provide three million jobs. So we have much to do. And around this goal, we have the following measures. First, it's about to expand the scope. Uh, for example, we expand from the urban areas to rural areas. Another one is to expand to cross-border services in uh, cooperate with the foreign uh, players and uh, to make Chinese factory to Chinese market. And the third one is to cooperate with the manufacturing industry to make the market in a more in-depth way. Another one is to use some technologies as, such as big data, the mobile internet, the express train system and the drone to improve our services. Another one is to promote the post and express parcels to, into, to be integrated with other industry. And the, po uh, the combination with, between post and the convenience stores and the supermarkets and then maybe in the future we should have this drone and another one is to have a good ecosystem between the government and the industry so now we have uh, we are facing a lot of problems in terms of the cross-border uh, services and uh, the government also have a lot of security demand so the government and the industry should uh, cooperate with each other to have a good ecosystem to develop this system, uh, develop this sector. And our premier have paid a lot of importance to our sector and also have launched a new position for our sector. In the past, we deliver the letters and the parcels. The premier said it's not enough. For our industry, 
He has three positions for us. One is the uh, key industry for the service industry. Another one is a modern industry that promotes the transformation of traditional uh, channels and facilitates the upgrade of consumption. Another one is the forerunner in the field of logistics. We are making efforts in this area. We also hope uh, all countries in the world to participate in our modernization process. And we are also willing to strengthen cooperation with all of you. Thank you very much. views on what is happening in China, and we will certainly come back to that in the panel discussion. Our next speaker is Deepak Chopra. He is President and CEO of Canada Post, the largest enabler of trade and commerce in Canada. Under Mr. Chopra's leadership, Canada Post has taken major steps to redefine its role in the increasingly digital economy. And we mentioned before, so he's stopping mail deliveries at home, and probably he will going to say something about this in the speech or later on. Um, so the increasingly digital economy, and we're happy to understand his views on e-commerce as an enabler for postal go growth. So, uh, Mr. Chopra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, we have the presentation. We're really delighted to be here on behalf of Canada Post to talk about cross-border e-commerce. I'm going to talk about the cross-border part of the e-commerce because uh, I think you will hear from speakers and you've heard from speakers. Domestic e-commerce is being handled, I might say, quite well in most jurisdictions. So just to give you a flavor, I think our transaction mail volume is already in the 40% range. So the, the notion that mail is going away is happening and it's real. And I think it's only a matter of time as we see that number continue to shrink. About 20 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, the predictions were coming in that mail volume is going to go down. And finally, I think it's happening. And many people talked about uh, what's going to be the relevance of the postal service if the mail goes away. Pretty relevant question. And as soon as the e-commerce arrived, as soon as the parcel growth arrived, there is a general assumption that postal industry will be okay. And I think it's premature for our industry to assume that parcel will save the day, particularly on the cross-border. That's the area I wanted to spend a little bit more time. For domestic, you've heard reasons, you just heard from Mr. Ma, you heard from Brazil, and if you look at your own countries, there is no doubt in my mind that you're coming up with strategies to compete, to establish products and services that make sense. But I really wanted to focus today on the cross-border. So the question for cross-border that we are struggling with, perhaps collectively, is the rules that were designed 50, 60 years ago to support a letter mail business, a business where our industry had exclusive privilege, meaning we were the only game in town. So the rules that were designed to support that industry for cross-border letter mail business are no longer relevant to support the cross-border e-commerce. And that is the challenge that we have to figure out together. On the one hand, we have countries who are benefiting from the export of e-commerce packages, packets, small packets. And it is very important that those small businesses that are now participating in the global e-commerce have an avenue to support their international growth. Or certainly the new markets that have been created for small businesses, it is a very important trade enabler that we do through the postal sector. But the challenge is on the receiving end. The receiving end of the posts is facing new challenges. You saw some of the packets in the previous chart that are originating from the exporting countries. But those packages, when they're arriving, 
they are taking a lot longer to deliver to the end user, to the end home. And if that service cannot be insured longer term, then this short-term growth, the short-term success of small businesses in those countries may only be short-lived. I think it's very important for us to understand that we need to find the right balance in terms of supporting growth from small businesses and being able to deliver the product in a reasonable cost. So the cross-border, when I look at the makeup of mail that we see in, in certainly our sorting centers, kind of begs the question to me, is are we satisfied to be the, the network of leftovers? Perhaps a strong statement. And, and I mean that only in the cross-border context. From a domestic perspective, as I mentioned earlier, I think many posts have done a great job and they continue to do a great job. But from a cross-border perspective, we have to figure out how do we create a sustainable business model that both the sender and receiver is happy about. And that's the challenge that I would call upon. I think this is the right platform as we set our strategic priorities for the next Congress. How do we find a balance where the product and service has the quality that consumers are expecting from other carriers? The service and a remuneration system that allows a balance between the sender and the receiver. So those agenda items are very critical for the long-term sustainability. I think otherwise there is a danger that we may, over time, ourselves reduce the business opportunity for the cross-border commerce and just focus on our domestic markets, which would be a great opportunity lost for post postal sector that has tremendous opportunity in front of us. So, I wanted to keep my remarks brief and focused on the cross-border. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chopra. You made some interesting statements, and I'm sure we will come back on that in the panel debate. Leftovers is something that is in my mind, yeah? the network of the leftovers. I will come back on that. Our next speaker is Philippe Well, who is president of France's Group La Poste, who is president of World Bank of Scotland for France, Belgium and Luxembourg, before being nominated president of the Post Bank and deputy director general of the Group La Poste in 2011. In September 2013, Philippe Well was nominated by the president of France as president of the director general of Post and succeeds Jean-Paul Bailly. France is not number one in European e-commerce, but with Philippe Val, the head of uh, La Poste, he has a clear vision on for e-commerce in France, in Europe, and across the world. Mr. Val, you have the floor. Monsieur le Prime Minister of Côte d'Ivoire, who uh, chaired this assembly, and uh, Director General of the Universal Postal Union, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, in my presentation, I am not going to look at these three strategic convictions on development of posts. In fact, I'm not going to say that I think that e-commerce is the new frontier for posts, that posts have a mission to be main players in the IT changes in our country, or that the post banks are a significant aspect of our future. I would, however, like to give you some specific operational points for what represents e-commerce in France, in Europe, and how we see it across the world. In France, first and foremost, e-commerce in 2013 represented 56 billion euros in turnover, 600 million parcels, and the increase in this market segment was to the tune of 12%. So it's a sector of the business which is growing significantly. So what do French clients want, the specific needs? It's more simplicity. 
So, for an e-commerce client, a customer in France, small letters, parcels, express delivery, these are all products for e-commerce. This is the basic reason why, since the 1st of January 2015, we decided that any product which was smaller than three centimeters thickness and was delivered as a uh, a, pass, a normal parcel and and other uh, others that were thicker than three centimeters were considered as parcels and this is something simple this is something that e-commerce pushed us to simplify and do ourselves the same thing goes for delivery of course in post France, everyone would prefer delivery of e-commerce products to be done by postmen and post offices through the channels that exist, in fact. It's not necessarily what customers want now. We need to adapt to the needs and demands of the customers and clients. What we're doing in France very simply, we have across France deployed 7,000 relay points, pick-up stores, in which customers can pick up their parcels when they want. These aren't home delivery and they aren't post office deliveries. They're separate. We have more than 15,000 in Europe as well. We'll come back to this. Second development, which is linked to e-commerce, is that currently we are developing a network of uh, connected lockers together with Neopost. I know that Wagner Pignon, the head of uh, Brazilian Post, has thought of developing this type of network, locker network, as well. So what's the idea behind this? This would allow people outside of the home in uh, significant uh, points of passage, so uh, shopping centres or stations, for example, to go with a code to go and get their parcel from an automatic locker. And this meets the client need. This is an innovation that was brought about by e-commerce. Third innovation, which was stimulated and brought about by e-commerce, is the predict product which is developed by our British colleagues, which is, uh, well, sending a message to the customer to ask them what time and where they want the deliver delivery to be made. And in this way, the customer can choose a one hour window during which this item will be delivered. These three innovations show how much e-commerce is really changing, fundamentally changing the range of products and the traditional methods of delivery that our posts have. So this innovation, predict, or predicting the delivery, was uh, brought about by European Post colleagues. And this is why I wanted to talk about what we are doing across Europe, Europe-wide now. So in Europe, across Europe, there are more than 300 billion euros within the e-commerce market. And this is growing at a rate of 17%. So this is the future of European posts. They are playing the players in this field. And this is why we listen to the will of the European uh, Commission, speeding up development of e-commerce, promoting the creation of e-commerce actors in the post European post. And within the IPC, we have set up a network which is called ECIP, and this is how we can provide European customers and clients, or e-traders in Europe, to have a track and trace system, a very high-level system for this. 
it will be operational by the end of this year. It's completely up and running. This is a considerable undertaking by all European posts, and this has called for significant financial investment, technological investment as well, to build a network that will provide a reference base for e-commerce across Europe. And for us, through our operators, who are called DPD operators, that's the brand. So in the 40 countries where we have a presence, they have a network that will be used on a daily basis for C2C B2B parcels, as well as more globally for general postal services. Here again, we see that e-commerce has pushed us to speed up our work in Europe. So now, internationally, globally, I think we need to see that ECIP will be a reference point, but that fundamentally we will need Ecom Pro network from the UPU. There's no contradiction between these different networks. We need to communicate and to exchange information with all members of the UPU. We need this space of cooperation so that we can build a new network. And EcomPro clearly corresponds to this need and will that we have for cooperation. It is in addition to what we have in EMS Cooperative. It's also clearly the new next step that we are taking together and this is why we believe that the various different uh, communities the response to e-commerce whether it be IPC post KPG Kabala post group or the UPU now then the basis of cooperation that we have with the, in the UPU and this assembly, they have the right answer, the right response to the major challenge and major steps forward for post in the next uh, 10 years, which is e-commerce. And just to conclude, I would like to thank our moderator, the Director General of the UPU and our friends from Côte d'Ivoire for having organised this conference strategy conference and thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for your kind attention thank you mr wow another good presentation with a lot of topics that will trigger for sure some intervention and discussion afterwards in the panel debate our next speaker is anne mirou director of division on technology and logistics in unctad United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. She is responsible for activities in the area of uh, innovation and technology for development of transport, transport and trade facilitation. Of course, uh, Anktad and Anmi will have a very clear view on the importance of the post for the uh, economy in general. Madame Miru, you have the floor. Mesdames et Messieurs. Participants. First of all, I would like to say that it's a great pleasure for me to participate in this meeting and clearly to share with you some of the of UNCTAD's perspectives on the role of the postal system in the development of e-commerce. Even the uh, area of e-commerce itself is a subject on which UNCTAD has been looking at for uh, 10, 15 years now because we had the first report that we had, which was the first report of the international organisations on this subject, uh, particularly on the issue of e-commerce in developing countries, we published in 2000. Recently, only two weeks ago in fact, we uh, launched a, a, sort of, a sort of update of this report and the perspectives and the questions that was were a very different scale. The subject of this report, report on the information economy in 2015, for developing countries, 
inclure. This includes a certain number of statements and recommendations that are appropriate to the postal sector specifically. I'll clarify, but I'd like to recognise rather the contribution of UPU, the development of this work and the excellent use of cooperation that we had with this organisation. So, I'm not going to talk about why e-commerce, although that is what's behind the debate. So in the area of economic development for developing countries, e-commerce offers real opportunities and benefits. And this is why a policy for e-commerce is a, a policy for postal services. There's a synergy between the two on a macroeconomic level for countries to consider these two aspects at the same time. So e-commerce offers opportunities, but we mustn't forget that there are a certain number of risks here. Everyone today knows uh, cybercrime is a problem, a fraud as well as a particular problem. It's estimated in 2012, and about $3.5 billion were lost in terms of revenue for providers due to uh, online fraud. And what's more serious is that cybercrime is increasing in volume and in a coverage or geographical coverage and the attacks. There are other important elements when we talk about uh, perspective postal, perspectives of postal services, thinking about the impact of e-commerce on competition and this how small and medium-sized enterprises can benefit from this new a communication medium and how they can do this and all aspects of tax revenue how can we ensure that a certain number of governments that e-commerce is also a, a certain cannot cause difficulties in uh, tax uh, uh, gathering, gathering certain types of taxes so this is up to the political uh, politicians when they look at e-commerce and the uh, different uh, parameters within this sector we mentioned several times, and this is also a positive and illustrative, the uh, remarkable expansion of e-commerce in the previous decade. It's estimated, that, for example, that B2B commerce has exceeded $15 trillion in 2015. Moreover, three quarters of this total was represented by only four countries, the United States, the United Kingdom, Japan and China. So the amounts are significant, B2B of course, but also we have the B2C, uh, business or consumer aspect, that as we can see on this graph is much smaller, even though this is also expanding relatively quickly as well. This is being seen particularly in the business of consumer. Particularly, postal service has a very important role to play here. Now, in terms of uh, geographical perspectives and global perspectives, I'd like to highlight, and we saw thanks to the uh, presentation made by the representative of uh, China Post, the figures for China. These are remarkable figures. And it's not surprising that China is uh, the biggest market in terms of e-commerce, the B2C e-commerce, this is. So, as you can see, we have uh, geographical differences. They are rather significant, as you can see here on the screen, by Asia, the, the share of uh, developing and transition countries will uh, increase and represent about 40% of the B2C uh, total in uh, three years' time, for 2018 this is. Uh, in comparison, if we take uh, African continent, Africa and the Middle East, the two together, they amount to only 2% of the global B2C trade and commerce. So there's a significant difference 
between the regions and, of course, uh, from country to country. And on the next slide, you'll see, well, it shows the two extremities, clearly on the basis of data that's available to us. And we can compare here the share of uh, those who purchase products online. And of course, in the left hand uh, section of the uh, graph, that's developing countries. And on the right, we have more developed countries, with some developing countries, particularly in the upper area, or we've got to GDP, for example, Singapore. and the Republic of Korea. So the differences are significant. However, the perspectives for companies and consumers in developing countries, well, they have opportunity to participate in e-commerce. The perspective is in are increasing. But here there are a certain number of be reasons behind this. The most striking, of course, the issue of connectivity because we're talking a lot about e-commerce in the last five years, and the progression has been remarkable. It's very strongly linked, of course, to the considerable expansion of uh, mobile use in developing countries, but also to a certain point, the development of social media, and of course, the use of the internet itself. A second factor for expansion, including in developing regions, is development of new e-commerce applications, new platforms, but also new payment solutions. And that's an aspect that has been highlighted several times already as one of the obstacles for development of e-commerce. Not only development of credit cards, but mobile payment solutions are a source or opportunity to expand e-commerce. And finally, the development of new local e-commerce services in, in developing countries as well. So I'll go briefly uh, through the rest of my presentation in saying that in developing countries, we've seen that e-commerce is expanding. The use of internet by small enterprises remains very limited, however. Licenses, licenses the option of having access to IT services at uh, uh, an affordable cost. There are problems of capacity, knowledge, competence, and a crucial element is also the option of having uh, solutions for delivery solutions available, which are online, electronic, or physical. And so this is a key point that means that posts are the fundamental drivers and motors and actors in the e-commerce ecosystem. I'll briefly mention one of the indices that UNCTAD has set up to show how countries are ready for e-commerce B2C e-commerce index. And this has four sections. The percentage of population that has uh, access to internet, those who have a credit card, of course, this would be uh, changing in the long term. We have um, data that relates to the existence of secure internet servers. And what's of particular interest to us today is the percentage of the population that has uh, mail delivered at home particularly for parcels. And of course, there's a significant correlation between the expansion of e-commerce and in particular this last this, uh, last parameter. It's very interesting to note that in uh, developed countries, 100% of the population have access to uh, at-home postal delivery services, when as in Africa, it's less than 40%. And in some African countries, only 10% of 10% uh, of the population has access to no service. So 
we have real different situations that show that it's a very important element to take into account for the authorities and, de and uh, decision makers in d when they develop e-commerce. So I'd just like to conclude with the recommendations made by UNCTAD. One that is particularly important today, which is the need to consider the postal system as a crucial infrastructure, essential infrastructure. And when I talk about the postal system, I mean the issues that were mentioned, the problems that were issues, that what can we do to resolve the contradiction between access to reasonably priced services for all of the population and all businesses in the countries, and on the other hand, access to uh, sophisticated services that meet the needs of modern enterprises and companies. The second recommendation made by UNCTAD is maybe to look at the system of addressing in developing countries. This is an obstacle in some countries that uh, the system is not sufficiently developed uh, to restore the services. And the third area, which is particularly uh, important for UNCTAD, is that um, regarding international trade, on, and trade facilitation internationally. We have spoken about this several times, but I wanted to particularly underscore the difficulty that we face. We have importer and exporter, and this synergy between the postal system and the customs system. Well, I had the pleasure to note that in UNCTAD we're working on what we call a memorandum of understanding between UPU and our customs, a Secuda system, customs system. The objective of this partnership is to develop and facilitate uh, data exchange, particularly the interface between the postal system specifically and the customs system. And finally, we could envisage improvements, and particularly thinking about developing countries here. That take Think about the entire economy. There are some uh, questions or issues that uh, need answers with regard to IT infrastructure, particularly TB, this uh, uh, digital fracture which has been highlighted many times by ITU, the development of knowledge and expertise in the private sector but also in the public sector and also the use of eGov services, which is an element that can be developed for all stakeholders. So in conclusion, e-commerce landscape is developing very quickly and it is in this context that we in UNCTAD we're convinced that national posts will continue to play a particularly important role. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madame Mirou. A very clear message from UNCTAD. Continue with our last speaker of today, and we have again the pleasure to have a customer amongst of us. Yeah, this uh, in the first stage we had eBay, and now we have uh, Jumia. Is it? Do I pronounce Jumia. it? Jumia. Okay, good. Um, there's a little change in the program. So um, Jeremy Dutte was announced, but uh, he was co-CEO. And the advantage of having co-CEOs is that the other co-CEO is here. So uh, there's no change in title, there's only change in person. So Nicolas Martin will uh, present us um, their views on what is happening uh, with uh, Jumia in, in Africa. It's a, it's a marketplace, it's an e-tailer. Um, and uh, Nicolas, he was previously a McKinsey um, guy, if I can say so. He went to MBAs in INSEAD and so on. And well, they are working on their way, on their path to make something big from Cumia. I heard Africa only 2% in e-commerce global trade, so we have a lot of work still yes. to do. So please explain yes. us. Thank you. Yet, only 2%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, and it's a, you know, it's a pleasure to see the, your, the opening of your minds to invite actually a, cons a consumer and a customer, and not only a post operator. Uh, and I would also like to specifically um, thank the Nigerian representation, of which I wouldn't be there otherwise. Um, 
I would like to very quickly touch upon the three points that I, we prepared for, I prepared for you. Um, just maybe introduce you very quickly to what is Jumia, because most of you might not know what it is and what it stands for. Um, from our standing points, where does Africa stand in terms of, of challenges regarding e-commerce? And therefore, and it will be my third point, um, how do we plan to overcome it? And how do we see and what are the innovations that are coming our way um, in this African continent that is actually far more vibrant than most of you might suspect? Um, so what is Jumia? Jumia is an e-commerce that was founded by a German incubator in 2012. Um, it started in Nigeria and it's now covering over 12 countries in a very relaxed definition of what is Africa because it stems from Senegal up to Bangladesh. Um, so, and, and it's actually an operator that is, um, I would say to put it short, an Amazon-like. Um, even though more and more uh, the, the, the successes that we see coming in Asia um, pushes us to, to revise the model and the, and the operating model we have for e-commerce closer to an Alibaba or even closer to a Flipkart that is definitely for us, I think, the best referring point we have coming from India uh, applicable to Africa. Uh, in terms of, um, of size, so Jumia is only two, point, two and a year, half years old. Um, last Black Friday, we moved around in one day 100,000 packages for Nigeria and 200,000 packages for Africa as a whole. Uh, we plan to have 2 million this Black Friday, this December, and 20 million the following one in 18 months. That's the kind of growth that we are facing for e-commerce, uh, something around multiplying the size by 10 every year. Um, <clears throat> right now, we have also Jumia as fully integrated in most of its country, its delivery and logistic services. Because I didn't found in the operator locally the kind of services that I wanted to have and the kind of services that my consumer and my customer wanted, I bought myself vans, I bought myself pickups, I bought myself bikes, and I deliver myself. Right now, Jumia all over Africa is at more than a thousand vehicles, and we are going to double to triple that size up until the end of the year. Might not sound much to the very esteemed predecessor in my uh, at that podium, um, but let me tell you: over the last year, I gained a lot of respect for what you do, because it's actually quite difficult and quite complicated to operate on its own. Um, Africa is therefore a continent full of challenges for, for us and for e-commerce in general. Um, and that's why the opportunities are also as tremendous. Um, also to, to, to give you a sense before I go into the challenges, the, the size of the opportunity is way bigger in proportion in Africa than it is in Europe, in China, or in the US. Just because the offline competition and the offline retail is so unstructured yet that actually retail is most likely going to leapfrog from its current state to a more e-commerce based like state. Right now in the US, maybe e-commerce is representing 10 to 15 percent of retail as a share. I suspect and we suspect that for Africa it will be closer to 30 to 50 percent in the next five years. Um, also to give you another sense, there is roughly 500 times more square meter of offline retail space in the US than there is in Nigeria. There, in a 20 million people city like Lagos, there is three malls, two and a half, to be honest, if we compare to European or Western standards. Uh, therefore, e-commerce is not only a revolution um, in, uh, in Africa, it's just a creation of something completely new, which doesn't have to face the kind of competition that you might have, that Amazon or even Alibaba might have faced in their environment. Uh, so, the challenges that we are facing, especially especially the challenges that are more, I'm sorry, uh, relevant to you, are obviously we have a limited pool of operators that we can trust and rely in terms of performance, but also a limited pool of operators in terms of capacity. Um, I'm already myself 
almost saturating all the private operators in Nigeria, as of now. Um, obviously, the second uh, challenge, as you might find, is a, is a natural one. Infrastructure, we mentioned it. Roads are the obvious ones, but also the addressing system that in Africa is not as developed as you might have uh, in Europe or in the West. And finally, I think it would be a big misunderstanding to think that the, the African consumer is any less sophisticated or any less demanding than any other of your and or our end customer. Um, and I would even argue that given the ecosystem and the environment and the lack of trust that e-commerce might face in those countries, we have to go the extra mile and provide even more services um, to those consumers. To give you a sense uh, of what it might uh, look like 80% uh, of our business is cash on delivery, meaning that you place an order on the website, you don't pay for anything, you don't use electronic payment, you pay only cash when you receive the product to the, to the delivery agent. Another example of service that we are providing for them is the ability to test and try, especially for fashion, at delivery. So the delivery agent will come and will wait for 15 minutes for you to try your dress, your pants, your shoes, to see if it fits. And if it doesn't fit, give it back to you directly. Um, meaning that we also change the way we do commerce with our customer. Uh, for instance, now we are automatically, when you place an order on, in some countries in Jumia, uh, placing this side plus, the size plus one and the size minus one. So when you order a dress, three are coming your way. Most often. For, what can I say, women customer, it's actually quite useful. They tend to slightly underestimate their relative size. <laughs> but it's better for us. It avoids us to do what we were doing before, which is deliver, disappoint the customer, come back to pick up, and retrieve the item. Uh, when facing or, or considering all those challenges, um, we are convinced at Jumia, and we because, not only convinced because of faith, but because we see it happening, that it will, what, regarding logistic services and postal services, Africa will observe the same dynamic as it has happened for telecommunication 10 to 15 years ago, which is a massive leapfrog. If you go in Lagos today, there is a better 4G access in terms of data network than in Paris because they didn't have to install fiber, they didn't have to install DSL, they didn't have to install all those stuff that we had and that we are actually reusing. Um, and they went directly for the last version of the technological jump and installed already and were at the forefront of it. Um, and what we can see is already for logistics and postal services in Africa, it will most likely be the same. Um, what we, I sum up then. Um, just when I'm saying, and I will try to keep it short, uh, the level of innovation that you might see here in Africa is actually almost as ambitious and, uh, and exciting that you can see in the US. For instance, Jumia right now is already working on a partnership that took five years for, for Amazon to develop. Amazon is developing a partnership with Uber to have extra express delivery, a delivery in one hour. Um, and we are doing the same with taxi operators. And that interconnection with, the inter with taxi platform is actually providing that level of services in Lagos. Um, we are also partnering much more closely with telecom operators. And not having telecom operators in, in the picture for you, I think, would be a big blind spot. Because all the communication to customer and the challenges that you were raising about following your package step by step right now, it's complete. It was complicated to operate. Um, Jumia has partnered is, and is actually 33% owned by MTN, the biggest telecom operator, uh, that is providing that level of services and that connectivity to the packages that we are offering. Um, finally, when we come to addressing the kind of innovation that we are also seeing is that we are, we are, we are going to launch in Q3, Q4, a service where you can 
indicate where you live, but you don't have any postal address, but you can also take a picture of the door step of what you want to see, and you send it and you upload it at checkout. So the driver will actually, on his mobile app and his smartphone, look at the door uh, and know which door to actually knock in um, to actually get to the address of the package. So if you thought that Africa was not burgeoning in innovation, I hope that those 10 minutes gave you another idea and made you change your mind. And thank you again for having me and having the patience of listening to me. Thank you, Nicolas. Very interesting presentation. And um, we now have time for a panel debate, I think. Uh, yeah, a lot of questions certainly coming from my mind if I hear you all speaking. And for me, always the rule, customer first. So, Nicolas, I will go to you first. Yeah? You mentioned clearly that you said we set up our own distribution logistics. Yeah? I think that's a very important <laughs> message here for this room. Yeah? That means that somewhere something's failed. Yeah? What have you done first? Did you try first the postal system and then decided, or was it an immediate decision to go immediately to a own distribution system? I think that's important to know and understand for the people um, here. Well, you're putting me in a tough spot because they have been very nice to actually invite me. And well, <laughs> uh, let's just say that in terms of timelines and delivery, um, the level of performance in some of the countries we operate were not the one we were expecting. Uh, sometimes some ratio of losses above 40%, um, and some timelines on average were two or three weeks to get a simple package delivered. So, What's your service delivery today? In how many days do we deliver? So right now, on our own, we deliver in... Uh, so I'm going to give you Nigerian examples, uh, but the performance is relatively the same all across countries. The first attempt is between two to three days in Lagos, three to four outside Lagos, or outside big cities, and the total fulfillment, because we make several attempts often due to the cash on delivery, where we need to actually meet the customer to have the exchange of cash happening, you have to add maybe one, one and a half day on, a, on those okay. averages. Short delivery times, cash on delivery, yeah. reliable distribution. As much what, as what, we can. What in terms of price? Was the post cheaper than your actual uh, setup in organization or in operations? In or terms not. of shipping fee, yes, but when you lose 40% of the package... That's true. Okay. So I think yeah. an important message here, I think, for many African posts even in the room, if you don't perform, if you don't get the things right, this will happen. Yeah? That's what I hear here. Um, Deepak Chopra, you said we are becoming a network of leftovers. Can you comment on that? I couldn't have commented on that better than what Jumia has already done. I think that's the context is changing for e-commerce. I think everybody jumped on it five years ago thinking this is it. And it may be it for a short period of time, but let's fast forward five years. Jumia has figured out that in developing countries we have a challenge because if you have to move from one country to another, we don't have visibility, security, tracking, and reliability. Let's, that's today. Let's look forward. Philippe talked about parcel lockers. Large platforms, Amazons and so on, they are doing their direct deliveries. So there is a real danger of disintermediation. And what would be left is what no one wants to deliver in remote villages, in remote areas, which is very expensive. So the problem we were trying to solve of the declining letter mail, we then inherit the problem of declining parcels. So what I mean by that is we have to, because in this market we are competing. This is, this is a market where Jumia can very quickly set up their own network. Uber can partner with anybody they like. So in this market, if our network is not up to scratch, we're going to be left behind. What's the most important thing we need to solve together here in the room? The exchange between our countries have to meet the basic criteria of quality, affordability, and technology. And, and they're all interconnected, whether it's, it's, it's the customs, whether it's technology, whether it's tracking. But these, we have to be able to offer some basic features at affordable rates 
that at least can compete, uh, particularly in the low value transactions. Okay, we're going to interrupt the panel discussion because there is an intervention from France, if I'm not wrong, and they need to catch their plane. So please be uh, short and precise. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference. And in particular, I'd like to uh, greet uh, the chairman of the conference, Cote d'Ivoire. And I'd like to stress the importance that France attaches to the work done within the UPU on the postal sector using the values of universality and solidarity so that all countries can be the players and the beneficiaries of these changes. Now, to come to e-commerce, which is the subject of this panel, a lot has been said by the panellists, giving precise examples. Personally, I'd like to say something a bit different about what we can expect from governments in favour of the development of e-commerce. What should we be expecting governments to do? Obviously, something underlying everything is investments in the, e in the electronic network itself, that is, encourage investment in it and um, bridge the digital divide, as mentioned. And I was greatly impressed by the figures given this morning by Cote d'Ivoire in that respect. And also, what has been mentioned a lot is to, me to, to gain the customer's confidence. We've had several interesting examples of that given by the customers themselves. Governments too have to play a role in this process. What role? They have to provide a framework that is clear, that sets out the rules of the, rules of the game for the customers. It's the role of the government and the regulator. The government fixes the rules and the regulator implements them. So it's rules about the services provided, on transparency, on consumer protection, against uh, unfair practices, any remedies available to them. All this is important in order to build up confidence. To give you two more examples. Information on personal data and how that can be preserved. That's important to the customer. And then digital identity solutions provided by the operator. But the government too can play a role there in laying down the rules, providing a regulatory framework that's um, made known to the customer. And finally, the government should provide their support to the work going on in UPU in the development of e-commerce exchanges worldwide. And here I'd like, of course, to welcome the e-compro program because it is very important. Okay, thank voilà. you. Thank you for this intervention. We go on with the debate. E-compro was mentioned. Um, yeah, Deepak said we are becoming the leftover industry. Um, you see things happening in Africa. Ecompro is on the agenda, is high on the agenda of the UPU, uh, and Mr. Hussein is here, so he can listen now. Is Ecompro the right thing to do? Is it fast enough? And is going is going well? So I want to hear from I think one, two, three CEOs here in the room uh, who participate, and then also from China. Are we on track with Ecompro? Is it the right thing to do? Yes, I told it very rapidly. It's totally uh, useful, and we have to do it now. Okay, Deepak? I would agree with that. It's the okay. right thing. Good evening. Yes, yes. Mr. Ma? Of course, it is a very wise choice. And as a uh, People in the government, we need to promote development of e-commerce. Since it benefits people, there's no reason for us not to support it. Moreover, now the industries are transforming. E-commerce would be in an even brighter future. Therefore, we need to support it. We don't think we will be a 
network for leftovers. We need to be proactive in response, in innovation. As for the role of government in setting the rules, I think there are many unknown areas of e-commerce. Therefore, you need to have all the unknown things known before you can clearly define the rules and regulations. As government, we need to establish a very good ecosystem of e-commerce, and we need to guard against fraud, cyber crime, and protect consumers. This is the basic things we need to consider. But I hear. You've mentioned, Mr. Val, ICIP, ESIP. Is there some overlap between that and the UPU? Indicating things in the industry. Shouldn't we have one solution? No, nous avons un seul. No, we have a foundation, and that's the UPU and Ecompro. And this foundation or base is something that is supposed to be shared by all of us, both for financial reasons and because of the complexity of the system. ECIP and KPG are complementary systems and correspond to different stages of development. And um, so it is up to the UPU to carry out this cooperation. In the beginning of my presentation, I asked the question, who will win the battle of the uh, e-commerce parcel delivery? Will it be the Post, the integrators, or maybe Alibaba and others? I come back to that question, but before, Monsieur Wal, j'ai encore une question pour vous. Mr. Val, another question for you. You are promoting co cooperation between posts, but you have your own uh, parcel network in Europe. You're not the only one. Deutsche Post and Royal Mail have one too. Are you competitors? How does this work? Are you competing with posts in other countries, but you're also using networks? Explain how it works, Mr. Val. We all know that modern business is not just cooperation any longer or competition. Competition or cooperation, it's a mixture between the two. So I think what we're developing in practice as the French Post is basically cooperation flavoured with a touch of competition. And as I've said to the Director General of UPU, we want to be actively involved in cooperation, but we also want to develop our business and be competitors. One question, who will win the battle? And you can only give one answer and a very short answer. Who will win the battle? Is it uh, <laughs> the Post or the Integrator or yourself in the delivery? The Alibabas of the world. The Alibabas of the world. Madame Mirou, qui va gagner la bataille? Who's going to win the battle? Madame Mirou. I wouldn't be so outspoken. I think there is a role for the posts to play. Pour moi, c'est très. Mr. Val, it's very clear to me. It's all the posts united here that will win the battle if there's a level of playing field for com competition. I think it's too early to tell, but I agree with Mr. Ma that uh, the call for action that we are all reaching out to build a network that can compete, that can be reliable, I think we can win that battle for a portion of it, hopefully for a larger portion of it, but it requires us, uh, and, and my comments were meant to be provocative, to get the debate going. No problem with that. And, and, and that's really uh, going to determine if we can come together, I think we have a shot at it. Mr. Ma, a sh short answer, but you know, Alibaba is setting up their own, uh, their own networks also. Who will win the battle? 
while I know maybe you want me to say Alibaba, but actually I don't want to say so. Therefore, I think what we say does not matter. Since I said it's something unknown, you cannot say what will definitely happen 10 or 20 years later. Therefore, I think those who would innovate, who would integrate, who would facilitate would win the battle at the end of the day. Once we've achieved that and make the best out of the posts, as well as our synergy with the customs, we believe, and I believe, that posts would be the final winner in cross-border trade. But when it comes to the domestic market, it's hard to say. Who will win the battle? The posts, the integrators, or okay. the Alabamas of this world? I don't have certeza if we have a competition. If there is competition, we'll be working in a more integrated way. It's very important uh, for integrators. I know that in our postal sector, we are competitive. can also compete internationally together with other uh, uh, um, posts, as our colleague from France has just said. We also are integrators. If we're going to have a battle, we, have, we are equipped. We have the arms with which to fight. Look at what we've done the last 10 years. But it will also depend on the society and the, ec the economy. And the first intervention that was requested was by IATA. So, um, Andre Majeres, can you please take the floor and give you very briefly your comments because we're running out of time a little bit and I want to give you all the possibility to have questions. Please, Ieta. Um, do you, you hear me? Yeah. So uh, thank you for giving IATA the opportunity to speak in uh, such an important event. We uh, represent 250 airlines and therefore uh, we are a major partner of the postal operator for the movement of mail. Um, we are of course very happy too about the growth of uh, e-commerce and uh, we also have to face some uh, challenges and I would like to uh, give you a few of those. The first one that was mentioned already is what we call the capacity building. Uh, volumes, if I may say. Um, today, we do not know precisely what the volumes are to be transported, what they will be. We only know very late when the goods are delivered, when the mail is delivered at the airport. So with the rise of e-commerce will come larger volumes. And therefore, we need to plan. We need to plan in advance what we are going to carry. We work very closely with uh, the postal operators and with the IPC to develop various solutions like the Postal Airway Bill or external platform that could be accessed by both parties. Um, we need to forecast volumes and allocations on board the aircraft, not only for various routes, but also for specific seasons or even days in the year, like Valentine's Day or Singles Day, uh, Black Friday was mentioned. Uh, Christmas, obviously, and so on and so on. Talking about volumes, I need also to mention the return of e-commerce items. This is what we call empty volumes. My wife loves shoes. She buys four pair online. She tries three that will fit, and she returns one in the same package. I have now one package which is three-quarter empty and carrier are shipping, carrying, flying those empty volumes. I think this is also something to be considered. Can you please wrap up? Sorry about that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so we have another intervention of Costa Rica. Costa Rica asked for the floor. 
Y gracias. Thank you, Mr. Summers. In commerce is a very demanding market. It requires a high degree of quality. As Mr. Martin said, representing Jumia, they create their own networks, their own structures, and that leaves the posts behind. Now we're talking about e pro and e-commerce a lot more, but it appears to be too late. Too late, perhaps, for those who haven't understood the importance of e-commerce or haven't changed the way they do things. So how to combine a traditional structure designed to deliver parcels, or in some cases only letters, and adapt it to e-commerce. I think this is the major challenge facing us posts. And I'd like to know from the panelists, have we been left behind? Because uh, we, we had to discuss the structure that uh, the market is requiring of us today. Thank you. Okay. Who, is, who is going to reply that? Maybe one CEO, maybe Deepak. You mentioned leftovers. I heard it again. So I, I, I think it's interesting that the point has come from Jumi and the pride, pride point has been made by Costa Rica. Um, I think this is the forum. UPU is the forum for us to address issues. We have, I believe, the right intellect. We have the capability. I think a lot of capable people represent our respective countries. And uh, I think the sense of urgency is what I would like to appeal to, uh, to UPU and to the member countries to, to, get, uh, to get started on some of the initiatives. With regard to is it too late, I think it's never too late. Um, E-commerce is 15% of retail sales in the United States. It's 5% in Canada, it's 2% in Africa. If we believe e-commerce is gonna be 20 or 30% of retail in many of the countries, I don't think it's too late. I think we can still, okay. we can still win. <coughs> Thank you for that. I have a question for the IB and for the UPU. We talked about e-com pro. When will it be ready? Who can answer me that? Is there somebody who can tell me when e-com pro will be ready? I think Wendy is in charge of it, so um, please take the floor and help us a little bit out. Can we have a microphone? Yeah, have to. please push. Thank you. Maybe try another microphone over, over there if it works. The UPU has no microphones, so I don't know. <laughs> please come, come, come down, come down, come here. There it is. July 2015. Okay, it works. <laughs> Sorry, now I'm yelling. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the floor. Um, the pilot for the e-commerce parcel uh, is, should be up and running in July 2015. July 2015, that's pilot. Yes. And then afterwards, from, really everything done and closed? From the 1st of January 2016. Sorry? 1st of January 2016. Okay, good, that's fast. Thank you. That's what it should be. There are more questions from the floor. Um, the Netherlands uh, asked the floor, and I, so I think IPC also, is that correct? Yeah, okay. So first the Netherlands and then IPC. Netherlands, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I have a question for Mr. Chopra. Um, you mentioned in your presentation also the remuneration issue. And I wonder if you could elaborate on the message you have to the UP UPU community on this issue. I, I think the issues are very well understood and, and um, widely debated. I think we have to find the right balance between the sender and the receiver country and, um, and, and allow our product to compete, not quite at the level that some of the best in class are competing, but allow it to move up from the very low level of service to some level of service, some level of visibility, and I believe consumers are willing to pay for that. Um, I think there's a, there's a gap in the product category where we can introduce a product with, I think Ecom Pro is, is a good start, but certainly we need to look at the, the regulations and the tariffs that were developed um, for a different purpose, for a different era. And I think these, these debates have been, uh, have been continuing, so I would encourage uh, the committees to take this issue and find the right balance. It, this is not about uh, win or loss. This is about win-win. Finding the right balance. And 
not necessarily overnight, even if we can have a glide path to working our way through to a more sustainable and a product that has uh, basic features that consumers are actually looking for, I think we can, uh, we can develop this to a more viable uh, cross-border commerce. Okay, thank you very much. First the floor to Chile and then to IPC. So Chile, you have the floor. Lisette Enrique. Lisette Enriquez, um, President of Correos Chile, the Chilean Post. I'd like to refer to a problem which has emerged here. It was mentioned by Nigeria and also Delegate of Canada. It's common to a lot of us and it shows you you know, the two sides of the new trends in e-commerce. On the one hand, there are great opportunities, but also many challenges that require the updating of regulations, processes, financial aspects and regulations, and that have an impact on all the designated operators. Just to mention what happens in Chile, no, 90% of, of items sent is small packages. In other words, they appear under correspondence or letter post, but they're not. It's, they're small packages. Between 2012 and 2014, there was a 60% increase. It doesn't, the, the price charge doesn't cover the real cost. For each letter sent, we are receiving 15 small packages. The negative effects on produced on um, the posts or the postal services by e-commerce in developing countries may lead to the restriction in growth of e-commerce, which will affect both importing and exporting countries. And just to mention a couple of effects that we're having to cope with. There are serious security problems and financial costs associated with large volumes of items sent, especially when the incoming charge is superior to the outgoing charge or charges. But there's a need for new structure, infrastructure, and new logistics. Terminal, terminal dues were originally designed only for letters, not for commercial products. I'm going to make a proposal, actually. So, uh, to sum up, the whole delivery chain is being affected. and our volumes will go up in the future. E-commerce products are being regulated by traditional regulations under the basic service as in the UPU acts and regulations for letter post and EMS. However, the financial clear, uh, the financial rules Financial treatment is different, and, and so is the customs processing in the case of e-commerce. Yes, I'm coming to it. We represent that important progress has been made, thanks to Brazil's initiative and, and e-compro but it doesn't resolve the problem of small packages. We'd like to make an appeal. We want to make an appeal to the UPU 
taking into account this new reality, e-commerce and its effects, we believe it's necessary to develop new rules, specific UPUs that regulate internationally a post postal service that will properly meet the needs of e-commerce in goods and it will draw up special and differentiated rules for developing countries in accordance with the economic capacities of these countries. Because you have to make now your proposal. Please, thank you. I am making the proposal. There should be anticipated partial um, clearing. Our working group should be set up to examine the regulatory, financial and technical assistance aspects of all this. To, uh, uh, to look at this further, so please. We have other questions from the floor. Thank you for your intervention, and I think the UPU Gracias. will take this further up. Thank you very much. The, the floor is now for IPC, and that's the last intervention. Sorry, we have to wrap up. IPC, you have the floor. Can't hear. Giving me the floor. Please uh, keep it short. Yes, uh, I am. Um, over the last years, um, the uh, e-commerce market has been growing significantly faster uh, than the postal business in this area. Uh, so I think it is not a sense of urgency only, it is a desperate uh, urgency um, since the Post consider the e-commerce fuel business as the single biggest growth opportunity and I think that's the reason why uh, 33 posts have asked us to develop this e-commerce interconnect program, which we have finalized by end of last year, and the features are now ready for implementation, not only within our membership, but also these are open to the whole postal world. So I would want to offer to the postal world to share our knowledge and our experience and the features we have developed for the benefit of the customers and, in the end, the benefit of the business of our posts. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for this intervention. Uh, with regard to Chile, uh, I got a message from the UPU that you can please forward your proposal to the people of the UPU. They will take care of it. They will handle it. Uh, sorry to be uh, so short on the timing, but we have to go on. So I think we had enough interventions, enough panel debate. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, these excellent speakers and panelists of this afternoon. Give them a warm hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They, asked, they also asked me to wrap up the whole afternoon, and <clears throat> I won't do that. I won't do that. You will hear the whole afternoon. But I learned a couple of things, and I will be very briefly. I learned that the global economy is an important element compared to the posts. Yeah? Posts are supporting the global in economy and are the deliverers of the last mile uh, in many, many countries. And I also understood that the last mile will not be electric. Yeah? No electric vehicles and no pizza deliveries, but you go on with your last mile delivery. Uh, innovation, we had a good session on innovation and I learned from innovation that you need CEO and top management attention to have innovation in your company and to bring it live. And last of all, I think this important session on e-commerce, the big future for us, but there were some strong messages that we can't miss the boat. We can't miss the boat and Ecompro, Mr. Hussein, I think you will deal with that in the UPU and with the IB to get it live as Wendy said, 2015, 2016, and then there is still a future for the post among us. With this, thank you very much for your patience and for your attention, and thank you for this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, before you leave, one important message for you. You are all warmly invited to participate in the reception 
which is hosted at the exit of this room, which is offered by Côte d'Ivoire. Thank you very much.